Right then. Hello everyone. Let's see if this is working. Well, that's... Alves ball. Thank you. That's better. Time to log. Hello everyone. How are we all doing this evening? Now, first things first. We have got a patron vote. Results to come in... 26 minutes, so there's a few minutes to do a vote on that, and there's a vote currently live as to whether or not we'll be going to be doing Lego box at the book building or Lego building today. Uh, book boxing is probably sensible to do what I need to do because I could have as little as two weeks before I have to go off and uh, decamp to um, pastures new to run the construction process, whereas my family will probably have about another ooh, six weeks or so. Um, possibly after that. Um, so, yeah, I, I really need to do get get some packing on. But there's also Lego building. And honestly, it's probably a case of what we start with first. Because, um, yeah, probably uh, it, it's going to be up to you. Because if we do the Lego, I'm not going to do a boxing afterwards. But if we do the boxing, I might end up doing the Lego afterwards. But it's, it's up to you all. Right then. So, I need to put the chat on live chat. So I have that wandering along, so I can keep track of that. And uh, where am I going to put that on my screen? I'm running out of screen space quickly. Ooh. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to put that over to here. Because then if that's over in that, then I won't lose that. Bingo. Then I want to put the other spot there, because otherwise if I disappear that off... It will cause me no end of trouble. That can disappear off behind things, like Obspot. That's the live chat. And I'll keep it as a live chat. Hello, everyone. And this is going to be where I'm going to set up the Q&A. Now, before we get too far into starting the q and I should point, uh, point them out something, someone about today. Um, I very nearly had to recommend to someone today to go and watch... Yes, Minister. And it's not normal that I do feel the urge to do so, but I, I'm going to explain why. And again, as I said, it's not normal I do so, but it came up because someone decided to do a comment, and well, yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting. So if I pull Windows Capture Properties and I go for that and I stick well if I do that with that. Oh, I don't want the image. Go away, image. Windows capture. off on that side. That's not much help, is it? So, I had this discussion earlier with um, Knight. And honestly, it was actually possibly nicer than it could have been. Uh, Knight basically decided to accuse me of and don't take this wrong way, Knight. I'm fairly sure you're there, so I'm going to say it. But you put, why do I buy into a myth? Well, yeah. Um, Knight had a very interesting take in that he took all my v videos about the Francisco Caracola class as meaning that I thought they would be amazing battleships. No. They have various weaknesses, and frankly, they're a product of their period. They're not going to be great, and they're going to be quickly superseded. 
But the fact is they'd be the first fast battleships, which would change things and give them a tag time. Anyway, this whole discussion, which was kind of interesting, although it did start off by accusing me of peddling a myth, and um, I didn't really like that as a phraseology, I have to admit. That's not usually my style, but fine. Knight, um, how do I put this? I tolerate your rudeness on occasion, because I understand it's you, you, you don't seem to tend to think through exactly how what you're saying might be interpreted by the person receiving it. Anyway. Um, I called them, I called them, I believe it's all these things. But no, it comes down to this one. I said, who said, uh, I'd said, if you go listen to what I've said, I don't think I've ever called them great fighting ships, except in context of fighting French. I called them world beaters, but that is because of the first, as, as the first fast battleships, they changed the paradigm. Up until that point, what mattered was how big their guns were. With the launch and the commissioning of the world's first fast battleships, speed would be it. And to the press, nor the vast majority of the public would even care, as um, fear over it could get the RN even more money for ships and infrastructure. Do you think they'd be saying, actually, to achieve what they've got an incredibly, they've got an incredibly compromised design, or would they say, Minister, it is grave news. Honestly, this gives the Raging Marine unprecedented strategic flexibility of use. As you know, battle cruisers can't fight battleships, and our battleships can't catch them. Our only option is to build something to beat them, and the vessels others will no doubt be inspired by them to build. Now, Knight took this as me suggesting that the RM will be scared. I didn't respond with the phraseology of um, go watch Yes Minister, but it was tempting, Knight. I, I know you always have lots of comments and you always have lots of points, but um, yeah, basically, if you've ever watched Yes Minister, any time uh, someone wants to get a minister to do something, it's usually grave news or something equally hyperbolic uh, to um, basically... Make sure the minister is paying attention and is going to be in the right frame of mind to do exactly what you want. And what the Navy would want is money for more ships, please. Because not because I'm worried about the Francis Calacara, because we always want money for more ships. But it was an interesting discussion to have and have brought up. I have to admit, it, I was expecting something after Drac did his five-minute guide. Because, yeah, if you go through the actual stats... They've got two inches of deck armor. They've got all sorts of issues. They've not got full... Torpedo defenses, as you as you would think they need in this period, etc. But the question is going to be: Have they got torpedo defenses? Yes. Well, they've ticked that box. Have they got the subdivision of a battleship? Yes, they've ticked that box. Have they got the armor coverage of a battleship? Yes. Have they got deck armor? Yes. Do they tick all the boxes so they're a battleship? Yes. Are they a fast battleship which can do twenty-eight knots? Yes. The headline is going to read, Italy's commissioned the world's first fast battleship. They're going to be that. It's the same as Hood was the world's largest capital ship in the 1920s and 30s. No one took any notice of realising that she was actually a battle cruiser, not a battleship. They presumed because she was the world's largest, she could fight anything. She couldn't. And that's the reality of it. Uh, the Lego book vote is in the community section of the YouTube channel. Anyway, it's just, it was an interesting thing to have come up. I was expecting someone to come up. I'm just not really surprised it was night, although, as said, mm, yeah. Uh, there is also, I would argue, there is no new evidence. I, I, I seem to remember, I went through my own, just to check I hadn't put anything wrong in them, yeah, my own key ships, which I'd covered... Uh, the Francisco Caracola class, and I, I, I oh, oh, uh, Francisco Caracho, uh, Car Caracciola. I cannot do the Caracciola properly. It, just, it always comes out weird. I do admit this one. Um, I went through and checked. Had I put in different figures than they actually had? Had I given them more deck armor than it actually had, or anything like that? And no, I didn't. Deck, armor, 50 millimeters, 2 inches. Actually, it's less than 2 inches. Belt. Um, the, the, the stats hadn't changed. So, again, I, I don't understand where exactly the myth phraseology came from. I, I did find that a little bit. Mm. But, yeah, I understand I, I understand where night's coming from. But, they, yeah. It was a case of, no. 
but it did go on for quite a while. And I basically wanted to say, I, I, I think I was polite, but I wanted to clarify some points I said, because um, one of the troubles, because sometimes at this point, you are getting messages occasionally responding from me when it's late at night and I spent the day in the attic unloading stuff, and therefore I might not be as polite as I would want to be. So, without much further ado, let's check and see what's on the chat and what's going on in the questions. Um, That should be okay with that, and that should be okay with that. Let's say hello to everyone, shall we? Hello, Runon. Hello, Mike Gooch. Hello, Team Locker. Hello, Carl McGuzzberg. Hello, Nice to for one. Hello, well, Santa Verica. Hello, Steve Clark. Hello, Duke of Petringham. Hello, Steam Richards. Hello, Blackburn Maximus. Hello, DG40. Hello, Mark Agnes. Hello, Rapid Torat. Hello, Hendrik Bofa. Hello, Seneca Nero. Hello, David Gauling. Hello, Dave Harrison. Hello, Ames Morrison. Hello, Autorius Dux Bellum. Hello, De Brock. Hello, Ames Morris. Well, no, I might have already said that, but I'm not sure. And, yeah. Hello, everyone. Clark, starting a steam boiler. Using a Dredge Queen Elizabeth, for example, if all the boilers are out cold, how quickly can you raise enough steam to move the ship? She's an oil fired ship. So, oil is different, but you need to warm the oil to get it moving. Um, you very rarely go let it go completely off. So, it's going to depend. If you're going from completely cold, uh, you've got to first warm up the oil. You're going to get one of the boilers started, and then you're going to use that to warm up the oil further for the others to get the others started. Um, um, let's see. Is there a graphic for it? Because they've got quite a few boilers, haven't they? Um, you're probably talking about an hour and a half to get the first boiler to the condition it's heating the others and getting them going. And then you probably have to add on, ooh, do you do all the other boilers once? Well, you could do all the boilers once, but it's going to be more, it's going to be more higher risk. So you might want to do them in stages. So you're probably talking about four and a half hours, unless you're doing it in a crash to have all boilers working uh, to have them up to pressure that's going to ha be able to give you the steam you need to be moving all of them you're probably talking if you're doing it in a, if you're doing it in a planned way six hours if you're doing it in emergency fashion you can probably do it you can do it quicker you can probably shave it down to about three three and a half but that's from a completely cold start. 
and that is very, very rare that a ship will be completely cold. Usually they'll have at least one boiler running and some generators, etc., running and keeping things, uh, fuel moving and warm. Oh, um... Dave Harris, do we have official candles to competent entries? I said it the other day. Um, we have about 28 entries. And about 14 of those will go through to the... Probably 14, roughly, will go through to the um, panel. Hi, there, everyone. So, question already. Uh, so, what would have replaced the... Okay, Night 6 everyone. Um, here's the question as you've written it, and let's think about this. So, what would have replaced the pre-Dreadnought battleships in the job of dying gloriously for the Empire to slow them the enemy down if World War I did not happen as ten Dreadnoughts were not enough? Okay. So, what are we talking about? So, if World War I didn't happen in 1914, are uh, we talking about what replaces the Dre uh, the... Pre-Dreadnoughts at in the Channel, or we uh, Channel Fleet, or are we talking about replacing the entire Dreadnought pre-Dreadnought fleet, the entire Royal Southern so Star Battle Fleet, because that'll probably take uh, quite a while. Some of those are fairly new ships. We're talking less than a de only a decade or so old. They could well be around, sitting in reserves for the next twenty odd years, quite happily. So um, you're probably talking about eventually being replaced by the older Dreadnoughts. Uh, but yeah, at this point. It's going to be a long while before they're all gone. And let's be honest, Agamemnon and Lord Nelson are actually younger than Dreadnought. And they don't have as much use in some ways. So, on again, and the job of dying gloriously for Empire, yeah, no. Steve Clark, one, uh, starting Marine Diesel, as by way of comparison, and quite fun in the current US again, how does it take to start diesels as one of the Deutschlands? <sighs> Honestly, that isn't something I've ever really thought about, how long it took to, it takes to start the, end the engine on Deutschlands. That's that's far more a... Would that even be a Drakenafell question? That would be more of a Sal question than a Drakenafell. That's the kind of question I would normally go away and ask. The only reason I know about the oil boilers on the Queen Elizabeth class is because that's come up with carriers, and I was extrapolating back from carriers and going through the boiler evolutions and remembering what the variants were. Um, when it comes to the Deutschland class... Mm, I haven't got notes open in front of me, and I haven't talked with Sal recently, so I, I don't think I'd have asked him about that. I've been asking about other things recently when I have talked to him, so yeah, that one I'd have to pass and go to someone else. Congruent, one of the interesting things is that both my mum and sister are okay with certain types of flowers. And if I got them Lego flowers instead of the very specific types of flowers they're fine with, I would not be walking the surf. So whilst I do enjoy the idea of the Lego flower decorations, I like my limbs attached. What happens to are both a patron, a little early, and Helios en route happening? Um, you could have some really interesting helicopters. Channel Fleet. Well, yeah, Knights of Glacier, that's very simple. It would be the old Dreadnoughts, which would go to the Channel Fleet first. That's that's fairly easy to work out, because that's where Dreadnought went. And it would go the same with the other 12-inch battleships. They'd have gone down to the Channel Fleet. And that would be in their force. And die gloriously, yes, but in that position. But, you know, they'd have fought hard and well. And they go via having an up, uh, having a upgrade of all their fire control, so you know they have a chance. <sighs> right, let's see what we got. What's the results so far?
Okay. Um, but yeah, Blackmas, basically you have a lot of very interesting helicopters, and the question is, who pushes into them first, really? Uh, C-Clock, question three. Rudder size on a naval ship. I'm guessing there's an equation between size, shape, placement, and rudder ship. Which of the three variables is important for creating a fast ship? Well, length to, be, uh, length to beam ratio is the ratio we tend to use to work out speed of a ship. Um, keel also has an effect on its ability to cut through the water and how well it cuts through the water, etc. And can also be a factor in sort of hull shape. Um, rudders are about control. And you'll often find they'll be optimized for control at certain speeds. For example... Rudders will have more control the more water that's going past them. So rudders have less control on a ship's ability to maneuver at slow speeds. But how often are you going to be doing the fast speeds? So you want to design them for around your cruising speed. And that will affect their shaping and their structure. So you want them to try and have mac and can provide you with maximum control at a speed you're most commonly going to be doing. Again, if you look at the decisions between whether to have single rudders, two rudders, etc. for ships, Iowa's Queen Elizabeth's had two. King George V's had one. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a whole debate over which gives you more control and which gives you less control. What are the advantages and disadvantages? But pretty much, again, you have to remember, a rudder exerts by basically creating a current effect on a ship. That's, that's how it works, by channeling the water flow and by shaping the flow of the water. So it needs a certain amount of flow in order to be able to work. The large also you again the other thing is the larger the rudder the more power the more force it the, the water also exerts back on it so the more force you need to turn it so the more powerful engines and systems you need to actually work it and you need some very very big engines very very powerful motors to turn some of the modern rudders on some of the modern ships because they have to exert against that much force of water Larry Maximus, don't take this the wrong way, but you are asking for something which I can either sum up in a sentence or I can do an entire video about. The sentence is probably not going to be an adequate answer for what you want from it, but the sentence is all we have time for because I don't have sli I haven't written slides and prepped it and all those things. So let's, it's the Russian Empire survived World War One, and there was the Washington Naval Treaty. How would this change their Whittle early scenario? Um, it would probably make the Whittle early scenario even more important. It would probably add things to it. But there again, how Russia, how well is Russia doing surviving World War uh, World War One? Remember, it wasn't in that great a state going into World War One. A command cruiser is a cruiser fitted with flag facilities to support an operator, support as a task force, uh, support and operate as a task force command ship. It'll have the radios and the data systems necessary to do so. Thank Jack, Jack Ray. Happy Easter to everyone. See, Richards, did HMS Shannon get any prize money for capturing Chesapeake? Yes. And if so, how much do you know? Um... There was an article about it. Where it's worked down, and not uh, the reason I want to look up the article is because the article included how much each member of crew got.
Let's see. Ooh. I cannot find the article for the life of me. I was reading it literally the other day. I'm sure it was on this site. Um, for those who don't know what I what site I'm talking about. I'm on Global Maritime History, which is a site I occasionally write for, and they had a really good article I bought about the Shannon Chesapeake, and I'm currently hunting through for it, and no, can't find it. That's annoying. Thank you, Jack Ray. Um, but it will have been on the order of, well, when I do know when she was sold a few in 1819, she was sold for roughly 500 pounds. So I doubt she was bought in for, hmm. Let's do a brute force search. Actually, um, nope. No, can't find it on the site. Swear it was on there. And it had a breakdown of, uh, of how it went to. Including extra bits of money they got. Like the money from... Um, the Court of Common Council, etc. Can't find it. So sorry about that. I'll have a look up for it because I'm sure I was reading an article the other day. Yes, they did get prize money for capturing the Chesapeake. Because prize money is going to sound strange to explain it. Ba uh, basically, what happens is the crew captures the ship and prize money, it's treated as a random thing, but it's not. They The Royal Navy purchases the ship into the service. So whatever money the Royal Navy purchased the ship for, that money is distributed amongst the crew. Okay, the Admiral gets a section, etc. And you know what. And they differentiate according to level of responsibility. But everyone gets a certain amount. So the prize money, it's not a gift. It's the purchase price. So because Chesapeake goes into the Royal Navy, you know they do get, a pri they do get prize money because she's purchased by the Admiralty for the Navy. Um, Siglark, you often discuss hull form and length of beam ratios, so what happens to such calculations when things like torpedo bulges get added to the ships? Well, that makes them fatter, so that affects the beam, which tends to affect their top speed. 
That's why most ships when they're bulged to get slow. Uh, the ships when they're bulged get slow. So anyway, what damages did HMS Hawk sustain after a collision with RMS Olympic? Off the top of my head, don't know. We'd have to look it up. Um, would have to look that up. I have a book normally about here, which I would go to, but it's not available at the moment. It's currently down there in boxes. And remember, if the UK decided to build Lions post-war realistic displacement. Um, Hendrik Bofa, I'm not sure where you're getting the free twin 14-inch guns from, because if they were going with twin guns, they'd be going with a Vanguard hull. Um, the Lions were designed for nine 16-inch guns. They are pretty much on their way to develop. Um... They were already 28 knots, so they would have been the same level of 16 inch. If you're going to build a line, you're going to build for roughly 62. So you're going to be basically building the line as it was planned, because that's not too different, dissimilar. But also, you are, if you were only building if you're building something of 65,000 tons, and you are arming it with six 14 inch guns, you'd be woefully underarming it for its size and capability. You truly would. You can just about get away with just to find out with nine 16 inch guns, but honestly, you probably want slightly more. If you, especially if you're only going for 28 knots. Uh, Frank, I'd like to see how many different types of cruiser type vessels can you name from history and science fiction? Well, all the exploration ships from Enterprise, uh, from Star Trek, um, they're pretty much cruisers from get-go, various types of cruiser, light to heavy. I know they like to call the Vo Voyager a frigate, but let's be honest, she's a light cruiser, if anything. Um, the Intrepid class are frigates, yeah, frigates like my... Mm. Um, Star Trek science fiction. And real, uh, from science fiction and real life. You want me to list them all out? A lot is what I'm going to go with. Because that could be a while. And a lot of me worrying about pronunciation. Um, but there's... Andromeda, of course, herself is a cruiser. Then there's the whole Daedalus class battle cruisers, which are a form of cruiser. Let's be honest, battle cruiser is a form of cruiser. Um, so, yeah, pretty much science fiction cruisers are the fairly common ones. Why? Because they're general purpose assets which go all over the place. Um, Battlestar Galactica doesn't really have a cruiser, cons a cruiser on the screen, but does have cr plenty of cruisers in the games and various other systems. Um, Babylon 5, there are various vessels which are sometimes called cruisers, there are vessels which act as cruisers, um, there's, it's a sort of interesting scenario, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one, but there's a lot of them around there, because cruisers are quite a useful vessel to have. My nice and clear for everyone, would a 15,500 ton, 9.2 inch armed county have been upgraded from 4 quadruple to 4 quintuple torpedo tubes at some point? Why? That's the first question you have. Why are you upgrading it? Why do you want to use that extra weight for 4 extra torpedoes? If you're going from 4 quadruple to 4 quintuple, you are gaining a spread of exactly 2 more torpedoes per side. What is that weight worth it? Or could you use that way for something else? So that's that's the, that's the question is, why would I be doing that in the first place? I could probably do that, but why would I do that? Would I want to use that weight maybe for 40 mm guns? Or would I want to use that weight for something else? That's my options. What? If, how much of a benefit are those two extra torpedoes versus options B, C, D, E, F, G? And that's the question. 
Lax and Maximus, if Von Space Squadron was still in Pacific, could Sturdy Squadron have taken the Panama Canal, or would the neutral issue uh, prevent the passage? Um, if Von Space Squadron was still in the Pacific, it would probably not have... It wouldn't have. In a nice way, if he'd been staying in the Pacific, so if he hadn't come round to the Falklands, then he'd have been down in the South Pacific, so Sturdy was already in the Falklands, so he'd have gone round for him. If he stayed in the Pacific, if he's gone north off the Battle of Coronel, then he can't use the Panama Canal either, and he's just getting further away from home, and honestly, he's running himself into trouble because he's running out of fuel. South America is where he can possibly get fuel. Anywhere else? Let's put it this way. If he put his, heart, his forces into, into America, what's likely to happen? They're likely to be impounded. So he can't go there. He has to go to small nations which are likely to let him in and let him out and evade by neutral rules and can't enforce their will. The Americans can roll some battleships alongside and go, you're not going anywhere, sonny. You're neutral. You, you come into our ports. You are now in po You are now under lockdown for the rest of the war. It's fun. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, I, the British wouldn't have used the Panama Canal. I don't think, St if Sturdy stayed in the Pacific, they'd have come around and got him, or he'd have ended up caught between them and the Americans. Or possibly the Japanese as well, who remember, because you have to remember, there is also forces, the reason he's going the way he's going is there are forces coming across the Pacific behind him as well. There are forces coming from the other side of the Pacific across as well from him, so... It's a case of he either runs into Sturdy or he runs into... What's the force hunting him? Is it Australia? Could be Australia hunting him. I'm trying to go from memory again. This is trouble. I don't... Normally, if I feel iffy, I have a book I can grab. I have so many books in our way in boxes, I, can't, I don't feel like it. It's a, it's a really strange experience for me in my after, year, after years of now doing this with all the books around me and being able to get something again, if I'm not sure, I can grab a book. Hmm. Team Locker, after US entry to World War II, what's the Royal Navy considering placing orders for ships built in USCRs? Not really, no. They got the escort carriers. Why would they need anything else? And also, there are all sorts of other issues if you have the ships built in American yards. They got the landing craft tanks. They got all sorts of auxiliaries built in American yards. But getting, actual, getting too many warships was not really needed. They had enough of their own production going on. They had stuff being produced in Canadian yards. They had stuff being produced in... All sorts of yards around the Empire. They didn't need the American yards as well for that. They did. I think they got some American built frigates actually as well. I think they did. But, yeah, it was... There was... It's not warships, warships. It's escorts, but, yeah. The, I think you're asking about whether they'd consider ordering cruisers or something bigger than that, our destroyers, and no... To be fair, they'd already got some in the lend in the um, how to put it uh, the uh, destroyers for bases agreement, which they weren't exactly the most happy with, but they filled the gap and they made Churchill feel like he was doing something. So that all works well. See, Richard, how good was Captain Philip Broke from the Shannon? Decent, Captain. Decent captain. There were a few better. There are a fair number worse. Decent captain. That's what I'm going to say. Uh, Steve Clark, I have asked about boilers. I'm guessing there is a steam heat exchange running from the boiler into the door tanks. Does this system use steam in the pipes or just hot water? That was definitely, that was definitely steam, but that one was hot water, I think, was it? 
Well, steam went into the exchanger, then its water goes into the... But no... Was it? Is it, was it, isn't that a double bubble exchange where it's got the oil one side, steam coming in the other, and the Caffron cream is water types, which are also the pipes which... Okay, this is the point at which I need a diagram to explain this, but basically they do not want steam and steam pipes coming into direct contact with the oil. Because you have to remember, steam pipes are the ones which are most problematic and most likely to corrode, because steam is the most corrosive, dangerous material you can use. And you don't, of course, want water to get into your oil, because water in oil makes it very bad for your engines. Even though you're using the worst possible version of oil fuel, ship oil is terrible, it is really, really yucky, um, you don't want it getting direct contact with water or st uh, with the steam. So I think what they have is they have the steam. So from what I remember, and this is from memory of looking at a diagram, and I haven't got the diagram to put up on the screen, the screen again, these are the sort of questions which... You're asking of them, them of me now, and I don't mind answering, and I'm doing my best to answer. But I would so love a slide to me answer them with and have, have a diagram to point to. But I, I seem to remember it goes steam heats water, water heats oil, exchange system. And that's to keep the pipings apart so that if the steam pipes corrode, they can't get it, can't contaminate the oil. Um. Stafford, uh, as more Trumps is yet to be released, I have been watching si uh, si uh, Simon W. Situation Room uh, series, and wonder if you've seen his latest on the plan. Thought about your posting your page in his comments. Um, honestly, no, I haven't. And don't take this the wrong way. I'm really not. I I, I see Drax content. I see Gareth's con uh, Gareth's content when he comes online. I see I see J Jamie's armored carriers. I see Sal's content. But to be fair, I've not got a lot of time for watching a lot of extra content at the moment. So I am um, watching my friends, checking up on them, occasionally chatting away in their chats, and otherwise being very insular and packing a lot of, bo of boxes, which probably I'll be starting in a bit because I'm just checking the results in. So I can announce Patreon. Uh, basically, I was waiting for Patreon to come in, the results to come in. Okay, winners are. Winners are. Uh, Michael 66. Admiral Henderson finds four pristine 1910 town class in a remote part of Welsh Duckyard. What does he do with 13 votes? And Stephen Meyer. Bolimetric tests are done right. What should have been learned with changes to ship design from those lessons with 12 votes? We have on 11 votes the Admiral Canaris one. And also on 11 was top five inventions that originated from the Garden Shed and British Politician's Dream 1931 Table Treaty. We also had an unprecedented number on 10. Uh, Black Max Maximus, it should be in a museum. Uh, Ronan, uh, alternate history, no treaties, the economic impact. Uh, Wayne B, speculation, what would a 21st century swordfish equivalent look like? And Black Maximus Congos at Jutland. So it was a really contested field this month. Thank you very much to everyone who voted. There was 170 votes cast in total. Thank you everyone who did vote. And I hope you I hope you like those two going through. And right then. So I have a cunning plan. This may work, this may not work, but hopefully it's going to keep the questions going. So, the plan is going to be to make the questions take up half the page. Okay? 
this. To go to here. And that's me. And it's going to follow me. Hopefully, he says. And then. We're going to go to video capture device. Two. Okay. Pick source. This might work, this might not work. It should work, he says. It should work, he says. <laughs> oh. Right, and hopefully... Um, that's helpfully... Now, let's put that... Below, and lock that into position. Yay! So, what seems to have won, as far as I can see, is the packing, which is what we'll start with. Now, I'm just going to catch up with the questions, so the questions are at the level which everyone else is at. Um, all right. Uh, nice no, What patterns did the British get into with continuous cruise construction that they should have broken? I would argue that some of their ideas about treaty protection cruisers were not necessarily the most sensible. The fact that they still produced them along continue they'd had this idea for producing a very efficient design from Nelson and Rodney, and then they don't continue into cruiser construction. I think that would have been more sensible. I really do think that would have been the sensible route to go, but they didn't. Um, Carl Gasswick, were there command cruiser classes in destroy leaders? Um, not really in World War II period. Uh, that's usually a flagship. Uh, 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 cr most cruisers are fitted to be able to be, have flag capabilities to an extent or another. Um, that's just it, the way it is. But some cruisers had those facilities fitted to them from the get-go, some didn't. And you also have the fact that they tend to like things like Edinburgh and Exeter, like, um... Edinburgh and Belfast, which had those facilities, or who were already bigger in the first place, so had the facilities more easily adapted and put into them. Night Secretary Front, how does the fog of war cause RAF Coastal Consolidated B-24D Liberator GR5 crew to signal all the signs that HMS Sunfish was not a U-boat? Because they didn't think that there was a submarine, a British submarine in that area, so they presumed, presumed it was a U-boat. Um, that simple answer. No? Andrew Bofa, if Jutland had uh, been only UK 9 battlecruisers and 7 German battlecruisers, is it fair to say the UK would be better off keeping at range with larger guns rather than closing in as Germany better belts? Um, if you consider all the other battles between the British battlecruisers and the German battlecruisers, uh, uh, between the battlecruisers, the British tend to close and do quite well, so... Jutland, it's not good. They end up fighting battleships. That's not a good idea, as said earlier. Um, Tanner Furka. Were World War II sloops built to civilian or military standards? I'm reading a book on Johnny Walker and his undergroom. The sloops do seem to have the rivets work loose. Are oh, they were built to military standards, but rivets still could work loose. Um, Steve Clark. At the end of World War II, one, uh, one, one, do, uh, Denmark got territory back they'd lost in wars in the 1860s. Can you think of another circumstance where a country got reparations in a war they did not fight in? Liechtenstein got something, but I'm trying to remember what. I know they went... Liechtenstein, to be fair, sent... I think, if I remember correctly, Liechtenstein sent 80 men off to war and came back with 81, because an Italian guy tugged along. 
Um, I'm trying to remember what else they got. Watching Drax's video on Shannon and Chesapeake, I am more convinced that it unlines your point about not accepting offer, offer jewels. Broke had a plan already. Showing up on appointment was a bad idea. Yep. <laughs> if they're offering a jewel, it's probably a bad idea. Um... Batman, did the design for number 13 battleships have small true boilers? Yes, pretty much most of them from that point on were small true boilers. Uh, Frank's on, how did a cruiser sink a submarine? Ooh. Not that often. In fact, I can only think of two times, and both were World War One era. World War Two era, the Royal Navy has theoretically the capability, but they don't tend to use it. Uh, it's more a case of, we have the capability, we don't want to use it. See, um, uh, Clark, glass hammer ships. Which five ships do you think deserve to be at the top of the list of glass hammers in naval history? Any of the early battle cruisers definitely deserve to be up there. Um, most of the age of sail ships are pretty darn tough. Um, I would say the Victoria class, the slippers, would not be high up on my list of what I would like to actually be in combat in. Um, some of the early American battleships. And yet, yeah, there's a there's a few interesting options, especially in Italians, and yeah, you have let, let's put this way. Some ships are built for a particular status thing, and this is something I was trying to explain in the comments back with Night Six Everyone on the Francisco Caracolla, uh, or Francesco Caracolla, Caracolla design. Um, they are interesting. In that they will have this status point of being, well, Hood. I'd say it's the largest capital ship in the world during the 1920s and 30s. So I had all this stuff built up around her. But she was a battle cruiser design, which was morphed up post Jutland into a battle cruiser design. She was not a battleship. She was certainly not a fast battleship or anything like that. And so it's like the Francisco Caracolas. They, they would have been the world's fastest battleships. Until they were superseded, but they would have been it for a while, and that they would have been the original fast battleship, and that would have given them a status until they actually got in a war, and then, as Knight, as Drac pointed out, and as Knight said, etc., then you find out they have all sorts of compromises to get that. So usually, any time a ship has a great status of being this, it has that, at the exception of other things. So basically, be wary of any ship where people go. This is an amazing thing. It's got this amazing capability. What's it got that capability at the expense of? Is always the question you have to ask. Um, Sam Thompson. Sam, uh, Clark, silly question. I'm glad you liked the X post. Although you did type an A as, well, as to what a replica is. I know it's a grainy photo, but sure you recognise that. Hmm. It was a fun photo. Dear Harrison. Cheese type radar antenna in the early 1900s. Were they really caught? Cool? They called cheese type because they were like a wheel of cheese stuck on the mast. Uh, there is all sorts of arguments for why these things get them. Basically, a nicer way comparing things to food happens a lot in most of the professions where you have a lot of people working a lot of weird hours and not getting to eat regularly. There is a reason why, in computer terms, we talk about bytes, bits, all those things. All those people working in pizza, uh, working on the fuel of pizza and thinking about pizza, basically, is it? And it's the same with navies and cheeses. If I remember correctly, book tech, uh, book boxing one by 102 votes. Yeah, book boxing has won by 50% to 46%, so book boxing is where we're going. But anyway, with us all set up, and that all's working. Alright, let's um, get a box out. Don't worry, you won't be seeing things, uh, we won't be staring at that particular level for too long. So let's see, what other questions have we got coming up? Um, 
So if the imagine, so the ember subclass uh, subclass towns were twelve fifteen thousand tons. Would twelve six inch guns be seen as not enough? Um, it was enough. No one's going to argue it wasn't enough. Would have liked more, but we'd always like more. It's a case of the Royal Navy would have liked to have had them have their quad turrets on, but they found the quad turrets actually reduced the rate of fire to the point of which it was not as, effi as efficient as the sixth as the triple turret. And that's basically your problem. Um, the quad turret is a very complicated thing, as the King George V find, and the more you scale that down, the worse it gets. This tape is blooming terrible. Okay. This tape is awful. I'm going to use this tape, which I haven't got as much of, so we might only get one box done before I start to go to Lego. But, um... This tape actually is something like a pro approximating tape rather than confetti that breaks off in your hand every five seconds. This is just not helping at all. Yeah, that way. Yeah. Thank you. Don't run out yet. Don't run out on me yet. I need you to work for a little bit longer. With that, it runs out on me. How could you, Fragile Tape? You were so useful. You've done so many of these boxes for me. Oh, back to you. There's a decent knife when I need one. There you go. Done. I hate this stuff. I think I'm on the top of the box. I'm on the top of the box. Wrong way up. Where are we up? Thank you. That's the correct way up. So, what was our next question? Um. Don't see. Did the French build their ships so ugly to discourage the British from capturing them again? No, they actually honestly thought it was a good idea, those ships' designs. They actually looked like dumb. Country road. Um, you know, they, 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 look, the thing is, they had an idea. The idea was they would have high ground. Uh, basically, what you're dealing with the French are a load of people who are thinking that they are Obi-Wan Kenobi years before Star Wars happened. They want the high ground. They always want the high ground. Um, other than Belgium and Poland, what other places in the world were they willing to go to war over to ensure that lands in integrity? Um, nowhere and everywhere. Uh, look, in nicest way, the British are not going to war over Belgium because they want Belgium to remain intact. They're going to war over Belgium because other people controlling Belgium territory is bad for British security. And they're going to war over Poland. Well, let's put it this way. When the Soviets were in Poland, did the British and the French decide to go to war? No. They're going to war over Poland because, frankly, they hadn't stopped Germany elsewhere. And they needed to stop them somewhere. And so Poland was the last chance. And the actual Poles actually had a decent military. And there were some people who thought they had a decent chance. Because the Poles had already fought several wars against the Soviets and done quite well. So, you know, there, there, there was a reason for it. Not necessarily the best reason in the world, but it was a reason for it. There was a reason for it. Um, and basically, they'd failed for Czechoslovakia, they'd failed for Austria, they'd failed for every other place they had a chance to look after and actually protect. They'd failed for Alsace-Lorraine, they'd 
failed for you know everywhere and Poland they decided to give it actually go and actually do something properly and honestly the best place for them to do it would have been Czechoslovakia um, because Czechoslovakia actually had a defensive region actually with the help of Poland and other people could actually have done something and you could have actually reached them, reinforced them, and there's nothing the Germans could have done about, about it. So you could have got extra supplies through them without ever having to uh, actually start a war with the Germans. So yeah, uh, basically, uh, World War II happens when it does, the way it does, because politicians kept fumbling the ball and kept thinking they would have more time. And they didn't. They did not have more time. In fact, they had less time. But that's not exactly a story. That's not exactly a surprise to anyone. Um, Runon, how much of the capital building program can the UK get through by the end of the war if Churchill is convinced to maintain course and not speed, uh, and not speed for the ch uh, shipyards? Um, the lines would definitely be completed. I don't know if any class would have come after the lines, but the lines would definitely be done. Uh, Maybe assisted the vanguard, or oh, the carriers definitely. Um, the, uh, the 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 larger carriers get done quite quickly. Um, the illustrious class. The really interesting thing is the fact that how much do they end up needing to do is becomes a question, because having the things earlier in the war, the advantage is going to mean that they're going to have the stuff available to do what they need to do when they need to do it. And for things like let's say, again, Battle of Toronto. Imagine if you got three, four armored carriers for that. That's the uh, that's you know the scenario you could be talking about, or at least two. And yeah, that's going to change the results you're going to have, and that's going to change where you need forces. This is one of the problems you have constantly in the Second World War. Is that it's a constant global wars, especially wars like that, 1934 are strategic wars. They're, they're, they are... When I say, how do I mean when I say strategic wars? They are wars which are, to an extent, all about strategic resources and about the positioning of resources. You have to be very careful where X, Y, or Z goes. Now, the thing is, the more of those things you have, the more places you can be earlier on. Or the more force you can deploy to deal with the problems when they come up. And that's the reality of it. Uh, by doing, making a decision he did, when he did, Churchill effectively, effectively limited his own options for much of the middle and even latter stages of the war. Because he ran out of capabilities, because those capabilities were used. If a ship gets damaged or destroyed or just needs to be repaired or upgraded, you don't have a vessel available for doing any sort of those the operations you want to do. The only way you'd have a vessel available is if you had another one available. This is one of the problems, is that some people forget that ships are finite things. Yes, you have a great capability. That ship's amazing. But if you only have one of them, and that one gets damaged, you have none of them. So you are constantly in a scenario of not just do I have enough, do I have enough to actually be able to have enough when things have not necessarily gone all, always gone my way. That becomes a problem. Um, I can see, Clark. During World War II, the UK and the US found they had a different basis of measurement over the inch. Which other imperial me measurements did the nations find were different? Um, pints, all sorts of things were slightly off and slightly different. It was fun. It was fun. Pressure measurements were really cool for boilers. And uh, all sorts of interesting scenarios came about. Um, okay. Uh, Cameron, if on Space Squadron had turned north and been caught and sunk by the Japanese, do you think this would have increased the USN's worry about the IJN earlier? Oh, it would have done, but it would also change things dramatically. If the IJN sink the American ships, uh, what there? The IJN sink the German ships in World War One in action like that, then they become automatically a very big power. They suddenly have a status. There's also probably going to be a heavy effort from them to be part of the force 
which is involved in the Grand Fleet. Because, you know, they're now going to be even more part of the war effort, if that makes sense. They're going to be critical for it. And they're going to think themselves critical for it. Which is true. Because they've just done, carried out a very major action. One thing is about doing this job, you don't need to worry about the gym. You have plenty of time, plenty of exercise. Now, how heavy is that already? Oh, I can lift that easily. That's fine. Hopefully it's fine for the, uh, the delivery, my people. But, yeah. Um, it's, um, but if the Japan, it, basically at that point, the Japanese are going to get more involved in the war. And if you then have Japan involved at, let's say, Jutland, because they decide to join, come and join the Grand Fleet, and they get invited to join the Grand Fleet, you know. After all, their mighty Congos have sunk Von Spey's squadron. Mighty Congos. So the mighty Congos get invited to join the battlecruiser fleet. That'll be fun. Japanese Admiral working with BT going, Oh, oh good God, you are a moron. Uh, that'll be funny. Actually, that could cause an entire interesting thing, because if the Japanese Admiral had the same experience as King did with BT, goodness knows what would happen. Possibly challenge him to a duel over being incompetent. That could be fun. BT killed by Samurai Sword. A guy can dream. A guy can dream. Uh... Alright, and what am I going to put in that spot there? To protect things and stop them rolling around. Can't be dog biscuits. I don't want to put glass in. That could be dangerous. Um, old microphone, anyone? Right, and that space. Ooh, what looks are we going to fit in those? Uh, cargo liners under fire, 1959 to 1945. Would be a good one to put in there. Should just about fit. And the Spanish Civil War at sea. That's about there. And if I can find another one to fit in the middle. Ah, uh, 614. Thank you. That won't work with you guys, will it? Okay, right, so you all out. We'll figure out something else to go down there. But ideally, I do not want these moving about too much underneath that. I want something to fit in that space. That could break a Lego car. Nope, too fat. Sadly, too fat. What do I think? Ooh, perfect. Yep, that'll do. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is the cheeky packing of uh, cheeky packing stuff. Um, Right, if Hendra Buffer, if minor nations wanted battleships or other capitals, would they be able to order forty-five thousand tons from the UK, USA after the treaty fell apart, say nine fifty-six? Yeah, they would be able to. Whether or not they get it is an entirely different matter, but they'd be able to order it. Um, probably would get it, depending on. Yeah, most na most of those nations would. Most of those nations. Would. Britain and America definitely. France. They could barely deliver for themselves, so I doubt they'd be able to do anything. But, you know, they, they'd try. 
Um, let's see. What is your favourite boarding action to learn about? Also, if you can't count Almark and Nelson Double. Ooh. Favourite boarding action to, co to talk about, um, to learn about. Some of the boarding actions at the Battle of Camperdown are absolutely nuts. They really are. Um, all sorts of weird stuff going on. All sorts of weird stuff going on. No, nothing about back is it Baroness Vickers MP for Nope. Um, Black Masters, could the Thames Ironworks and Dockyards have been received in 1915 before the Royal Flying Corps took it over to produce ships? Ooh, potentially. Potentially. If you got in there early enough with funding and a reason to, build, to do so, yeah, you could have done it. Could have. Um, at which point is Cruiser officially a carrier? Frank Smart. Uh, when it's primary, as I've said before, my definition of an aircraft carrier, or any version of carrier, is when its primary means of defence and offence are the air group of parasite craft it carries. Now, some people find that interesting to go, you know, how can that be? If your primary means of defence and your preferred means of defence is to destroy the enemy a long way away from you, so they can't attack you, then your fighters are your primary means of defence and offence. If they are, your plan is to intercept any any, any missiles, etc. Things. Um, and I know people like to talk about Delta V and all these things, but yeah, is your parasite craft? Then you then you're a carrier. If it's not, if your primary means of defence are your onboard weapon systems, then you're probably not a carrier. Or you're a mixture of something. If you consider the Daedalus class, they had beam weapons, they had missiles, and they also had fighters. And let's be honest, they were not really picky about what they used. They would use whatever works best at the time they needed to use it. Plus board... GT. It worked. Right. I have to figure out how to get where to put this down on the floor. This is when my cunning plan starts to fall apart, doesn't it? Because I did have a cunning plan. Can't go back up there. <sighs> cunning plans. They always fall apart at the, at the worst time. Let's answer some questions while I think about it. Um, nice second. So, uh, if the British built the Phantoms at 10 to 13,000 13, tons, Gloucester's at 10 to 13,000 tons, Edinburgh's at 10 to 12 to 15,000, does that make the eventual Neptune class larger? Potentially. More than likely. Uh, see, Clark, naval design access. Which is your opinion the most significant accident in naval architecture in history? Um. Ooh. Not the sinking of the captain. Um, what's the most significant naval accident, accident in history? Honestly, straight enough, I'm going to say Titanic. Because it's when really the concept of not just um, divisional division on terms of length along the ship mattered, but people started thinking about division up the ship. In terms of it, it, it start, it's important for warships and for other ships. You know, it, it matters. I don't think I. Let me just check key doesn't on. Ankle. Why is it camera? The moment I wander in this direction, you lose me and go off to the weird corner. Why is it camera you do that? Because I stand here. Hello. Yeah, that's you have one bad thing, camera. You go the moment I go off that way too far, you go off to that corner for some reason. Don't know why you get attracted by that corner. 
Take me home. Need to take that me. Da -da -da. Good old Calyx system. Stay there for a second. Right then, so those are the expeditionary boxes, and I need the expeditionary boxes to stay together, don't I? Yes, I do. And I'm talking to myself, I do realise this, everyone. Swiveling off. There we go. Okay, so anyone who thinks that I'm ever moving again, no. Um, uh, when I buy, eventually buy a home for myself, if I, you know, am in that situation where I'm lucky enough to be doing that. It will be within walking distance of the home we're moving to, so I do not have to move the books. Actually, I'll get one of these. Ay, oh, caramba. So. Um... So, question, nice different question. So, why is it overlooked that the Iron Off World War was facing the very problem in cruises that the ESN had post World War II? Treaties. So, everything's put down to the treaties rather than the reality of. We've got a load of cruisers which are not suitable for the war we now find ourselves in. Um, uh, what I, question eight. Uh, if the British built Southampton's. Da, 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 I answered that one. I think. Hang on, no, there's a part two. What would change about them? The historic refits probably don't happen as they did. Honestly, if you're making that many, that much tonnage changes, and you're bumping up the certain the scenarios, if you're, if you, it's going to depend on a lot of factors. It's going to depend how they work. And let's be honest, does Edinburgh doesn't historically go through many refits because she gets sunk during the war. That tends to have an effect on your refit strategy if you get sunk. So the thing is, if you change the ship and she maybe doesn't get sunk because she's better at survival, the hit hits her differently, or she's positioned slightly differently, or because she responds in a different way to the procedures, or they don't, and they have sort of better air defense or something like that, then it's going to change things. Right, sorry, what is wrong with pronouncing the Italian ship names in their English format? Julius Caesar, uh, Caesar instead of the normal name. Um, Well, I try to get it uh, to do to do the right one as a sign of respect, but I am. I labour under two two major problems. One, I was taught Latin pronunciation a long time before I started learning uh, uh, learning um, Italian pronunciations of things, and uh, the thing is. I end up in fun on that one because, as I was taught Latin, some of the pronunciations are different. And honestly, I'm not getting involved in that one because that's for my Latin teacher to deal with. Um, I, it's just how I was taught to pronounce them. And um, I passed exams in the UK pronouncing them. But apparently it's not the right way to pronounce them, so yeah. I get in the fun. But it's it's one it's one of the the, the jokes it's when we got when you got Latin pronounced um, in ship shape usually it's sent to me when you want Italian pronounced you try you send it to drag and we're both in a constant the, the trouble is, the I would say the other problem for me is as said I gave up learning or rather I didn't give up learning Latin languages I was stopped from learning languages because dyslexia meant that 
the uh, lect- uh, the teachers at school didn't think I could actually do foreign languages. Um, I had a fun French teacher who um, was a very nice guy outside of the French classroom. Inside the French classroom was an absolute... Hmm. We'll leave that to one side. Um, if the wrong, well, look, say, uh, when writing articles for other sites, do you, cho- do you choose or today what's the most interesting article that you've written? Um, ten, uh, ooh, it depends. If it's global maritime history, they don't pay, so they get, uh, so I write what I sort of, find interesting for them and they then decide whether they want to accept it or not so that's sort of on them uh, if I'm being paid then to an extent it's a case of what do you want and you have the power to influence that depending on how much you're paying me it's like when someone says is is basically they, they want me to do it and they're going yeah I'll take you out for breakfast as a thank you for doing this then that's basically the same as global maritime history. It's a case of you're going to give me breakfast. The person who said that to me, by the way, and I wrote an article for that magazine, which I still am proud of that article, and for the magazine, um, they've never taken me out to breakfast. Ever. In fact, I have, think I've paid every time we've ever got together. Um, because they never have money on them. So, um, yeah, they, they, they got what I wanted to do. But if you're talking about Warships International Fleet Review or something like that, or the history, history magazines, um, they, it can, they will sometimes approach you with article ideas, and you'll write for them, and sometimes you will forget, and you'll submit an article on something else, and they'll go, hang on, have you written the, this article yet? And go, no, was I supposed to? Oh yeah, you send an email saying you would look at you consider it. Okay. Uh, is this an American or British magazine? It's an American one, of course. They don't realise it. Basically, if you're dealing with a British person, we write, we're going to write you something like, oh, we'll consider that. That's basically us saying, we're not going to do this, but we're not going to say we're not going to do it, because you never know, there's an opportunity you might change our mind, but the odds of us doing so are very, very low. Now, if you don't know why I'm doing this on the inside... Now, if I was going to be leaving these in here for months, I wouldn't be doing that. I And when I say months, I mean basically, if they were going to be in more than six months, you wouldn't want to put the plastics stuff in with them, in with the books, because it can cause all sorts of issues. But, if you're going to be leaving less time that, then it does add extra rigidity to the bottom to help the weight, and help protect the things and the, all the books in there. Lost two books in this section. Done. Um, yeah, so basically, yeah, it depends on who's asking for the article, what I'd write. Uh, Frank, let's see. Is it right to suggest that the battleship and destroyers have much more in common, operate more consistently with each other, while carriers and cruisers do the same with each other as well? Um... I'd say certainly you have a good case to make for that in the 1930s and to set in the 1920s. Uh, World War II, I'd say it depends what kind of destroyer you're talking about. And I'd say post World War II, you very much the large fleet destroyers have taken over both roles, and so they operate quite well with everything. They have to. They have to. That's their, that's their reality. Um, now, nice Aaron, how many of the 12,000 tons, 16, 6 inch towns would the British realistically be able to build? Okay, if you, the, the criteria is if you don't have the 1937 treaty comes through, so you keep building the, the, them and you are going to continue building those, basically replace every Caron colony with uh, one of those ships. But the odds are the British wouldn't have built the 16 gun because, as I've said, the quad gun 
they were looking at its complexity and the uh, realities of operation, its maintenance, etc., all added up to so much, it wasn't. It was not worth its money versus the triple turret. You are more likely to get a revision of design to be a five triple turret design with three turrets forward and two aft than you were to get the quad of the four four turret co configuration, simply because of the reality of operating that quad turret. Quad turrets are a frigging nightmare. As I said before, one is X problems. Twin guns. Um, that is potential. That is both X problems, X problems, and X problems in between. So it's basically three X problems. And this one, that's five X problems. And this one, that's seven X problems. And at a certain point, those problems start to interfere with the operation of each other. When you're talking about a battleship gun and, and its rate of fire. That is less of an impact than a six inch gun cruiser where everything depends on maintaining that rate of fire. That's 10 to 12 rounds per minute. If you can get that out of all three guns, great. But if you're using four guns and it swaps down to eight, well, let's put it this way. If you've got four firing eight rounds a minute, that's 32 rounds. If you've got three firing 10 rounds a minute, that's 30, so it's better. But if those three guns are able to fire 12 rounds a minute, that's 36, which means that's better than the four. And that's the thing, the, three, the triple turret can continue to 10 to 12 rounds a minute. The four, it drops to eight to 10. Now that can be more, but it can also be a lot less. And it's also a lot likely to be less because you have people getting into each other's way and you have far less space in the turret and far less space to maneuver and far more things get able to go wrong. So it's better in the end to go with the triple configuration. I found Swedish easy to learn. Um, I'm looking forward to using Swedish. And I've been having fun conversing with some of the museums in Swedish. Um, but they are, my Swedish is getting better, I will say. Uh, it's Battle of Matapan. Um, that one's going to stay there because that one's a good account. That's Battle of Matapan by SWC Pack. That is a very old account of the Battle of Matapan, but it's worth reading. Uh, Storm and Conquest, The Battle for the Indian Ocean, 1809. It's by Stephen Taylor, and it's actually a really good work book. And, of course, this is Antonia Fraser's Cromwell. Because, yeah, I know some people don't like it, but I've, I always find her books good. They're usually good starting points for me to dis uh, for me co uh, to cover other stuff. Okay, where am I starting from? I'm going to clear through these because then I've cleared up that shelf and then I can maybe use that space for things. I can maybe move books up there, which are books which I, I can start moving books up there, which are books are going back uh, going up the expedition room. Yeah, slowly working things through. Slowly, slowly one works through things. Um. Okay. Uh, which, in Samarison, which experience during the 19th century, ha after 1815, had the most significant effect on the Royal Navy? You see, I'd love to say the Crimean War, etc., or something like that, but I'd say it's HMS Warrior. Because up until you get Warrior and, um, you know, the Gloire, you, you don't have, ships are really much of a muchness they're all pretty much the same even the steam um, steam rates are not really that big a difference in the battle that you know, sort of Andrew Lamb talked about in battleships in transition in transition but the reality is once you get the Gloire and the warrior the Royal Navy sees how you can seize the global identity of something by achieving a technological feat. They realize they get sort of hang on. This is another tool we can add to an image. We've now got such a pace of technology, we can do something which sets the tone the rest of the world has to live up by. And that's when you really start to see them starting to flex their muscles as a benchmark navy. And that's then what they're trying to repeat with dreadnoughts, and they try and repeat with various other things to maintain that sort of superiority cheaply in a way by being the benchmark navy. Keep that out because that needs to come with me. Don't need and that can go in there. 
That one's a good one though. It's a good book to read. It can fit in there. Oh, it does fit in nicely. How does that fit there? Um, come on. The chat's having fun today. Get a real knife and keep up with it. Um, look, don't take this wrong way. I have knives for cutting. The reason I'm using a screwdriver is because someone keeps losing what they're cutting with a tape with and keeps nicking my knife. Or knives, rather. She's on the third. This person who's doing this will remain, remain nameless. I say that book caused an interesting conversation. Uh, ooh, that was a few years back. But I was teaching the Falklands War. And I was going through a Falklands War. And this was one of the books I brought in with me. And someone actually objected to me having this book with me. Because they felt they don't didn't like Margaret Thatcher. And I said, how can you teach the Falklands War without teaching about Margaret Thatcher? Well, she doesn't matter to it. She does. The entire impression of the junta in many ways was informed by their perception of what a female leader would do. The fact that they didn't bother to find out what kind of female leader Margaret Thatcher was will lead to one another side because that's what there was there, misjudgment. And yeah, well, you know, things got real very quickly for them. And they found out that, oh, sugar, this lady doesn't mind fighting. In fact, one could almost argue relished it in some regards. Because she was finally able to put some people's ideas about her to rest. Oh, that will go in there. Now... Backmasters, what if Nagato had been preserved as a, to as a trophy museum ship in Pearl Harbor? Next to preserve U.S. Enterprise, C6. How would this impact historical preservation, the ship, sh uh, ship shape America trip? Uh, it would mean it would be, actually would have been happening. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting scenario. If it had been preserved in Pearl Harbor, it would definitely have made it a, vi a, a, a trip for ship shape crew. Although, to be fair, Drax already done so many of the American ships that it would be a very interesting... It's basically, he would have to be giving a tour to the rest of the ship shape crew or something like that. Because, frankly, he's already been to them all. Um, see him, Drake's Bofa. If the Navy's kept building battleships, in your opinion, could we have seen single main gun turrets thanks to autoloading? No, we'd have gone to twin. Dual turrets, maybe, but never to singles. Um, the sheer volume of fire, if you need that sort of firepower, would mean it would be not a singles. You might be down to roughly a pair of to a pair of two, tw a pair of twin turrets, but that's about it. Um, let's take over on question ten. Would the Royal Navy have preferred a large, cr larger crown colony class with the capabilities of an early town class? Yes, but. You build what you are allowed to build. You build what you have funding to build. And you do it with grace. Ooh. That's, um... That I need to keep out. That... Which one's that? That's Dover Patrol. That can go there. I won't need that till next year. Not for the channel anyway. Uh, what about for writing? When I need next writing? I think that topic doesn't come up till then, so I'm okay with that. Yeah, that can go in there. All right, I need that for right uh, for up what's coming up. Need that for what's coming up. Need that for what's coming up. That's don't need that for what's coming up, so that can go in here. And I can put it down the side, it'll nice and nice and safe. Um, da -da 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 -da. There you go, nice and 
taken there. Uh, I need Kamikaze, I need 1939. Uh, I, no one needs Total War Germany. It's a good book, but it really isn't necessary for what I'm doing at the moment. Isn't necessary for that. Let's see, what's the next question? Um, besides the amateur, is there any other ship that if survived that the potential historical information that could be attained could validate or not validate the number of theories on their build? I'd love to say Hood surviving would be useful because I could take someone around there and go, this is a battle cruiser. Um, but no, uh, I, I don't think I can just uh, just go with that. I think I have to have provided something which is a slightly more legitimate answer than just so I don't have to keep hearing people trying to describe her as a battleship. Um, more historical significant. Get that up so I don't knock it over. What would be useful? Well, that's a fun book. Atlantic Mediterranean, Naval Battles World War II, and Power and World's Airliner. They're both fun books. Um, Honestly, I, I, I think Yamato is one thing, but I think we'd also like some early aircraft carriers. You know, if you think about what we've got surviving, we have got some very nice carriers surviving, but we have got none of the really early ones. So I would love it if Saratoga had survived. I would love it if Illustrious had survived, those sort of things. Uh, or Furious. Furious have been really interesting to have survived because she'd gone through so many versions. Oh, sub within it by Ludovic Kennedy. That's a good book. Um, she's gone through so many different conversions and so many different adaptations. That really, really interesting vessel and really interesting history. Um, Canadian operations of World War II, as useful as that is and interesting as that is, not necessary for what I'm doing at the moment. Um, so that's right about there. Okay, it's sort of there. Um, but yeah, it's it would be a case of yeah, I'd like it to be Furious and Saratoga. That would be really, really cool. Ah, uh, Stalin. The Mitri Volkanov's account of Stalin. Uh, probably one of the best. Now, not actually necessarily the most accurate in its analysis because of, yes, uh, Dmitry Volkanov is um, very much uh, later, uh, later uh, leader's man. But uh, leaving that to one side, it is a very, very comprehensive study. And you're unlikely to find similar coming out of the Russian archives anytime soon. So it provides a lot of information which you might not get elsewhere. I will find a space to plot it, uh, plot it about uh, soon. That's, that's not there. No, it can't go there. It could go there. But I need to find something else to go there and there and there. I'll figure this out. This is Jenga. Unfortunately, my Jenga master is not here. We have a Tetris Jenga master in chip shape, and he is absolutely raising these things. Me, less so, but I try. Oh. So, for up to UK battleship, does the increase of the Ronnie's battleships prod the USN to finish off the two hours? Uh, yes, yes, and yes, probably. Honestly, if there are battleships being produced, they will want to probably build their own. Um, how am I calculating which book goes into which box uh, by shelf? So I know which shelf and what set they're with, and once I get them out, I'm going to reorganise them again because I'm going to have a whole new shelving system. So it's a case of it's organized but it's also organized by what goes where now is helpful for me in when it comes to finding it not necessarily helpful for me in terms of positioning it right now yeah, there goes 
there. But, you know, if you're... How do I put this? How do I put this? If you're like me and you spend enough time with your books, you sort of... No, uh, yeah, honestly, each of these boxes I'm putting slight different phrases on the top of them, and that's going to help me find them when I need to find them. Um, if I need to go fight hunting them. If I need to go hunting for them. I probably won't need to go hunting for them. I'll probably very quickly find them and set them up. I, as much as I'd like to have that other world, I don't need extra books. There's only so many books I can take with me. And um, that will need. That one, sadly, I don't need for this trip. Um, ah, favorite fortune, Captain John Coleman. Um, okay. So, um, no, sir, quite does nine to ten months. Look, it's going to in nice way. Nine six eight one. It's going to depend. If you've got no treaty scenario, there's no way to crown colonies to build as life as they are. So if you don't have the treaty scenario, the, the second London treaty, you're not going to have the crown colonies the way they are. So, you're, the, the crown colonies are built to the maximum of the second uh, the, the second London naval treaty. That's defines them, not what the Royal Navy necessarily wants. And then the disparate sea you see in their construction, that's down to the differences of construction, of construction date of finishing, and all those things. And um, yeah. That, it's basically, it's that simple. It's a case of, this is what we have available, this is what ha this is what we're able to build with, this is what we've got access to, we'd like to do more, but we can't, so this is what we can do. It's not a case of, I would like this, it's a case of, what can I get under this criteria? And that's the ca that's the Crown Colonies. Um, What if Von Spade got into a fight with very similar to what happened off Henderson Airfield with the IJN in 1914 at similar ranges? Um, honestly, the IJN in 1914 is going to overwhelm him. Because um, the sheer volume they're going to bring versus what he brings. You know, Congos, etc. I, I, I know some people have real love for the Shan Horse and Nice Now of Von Spey, and they. And there are some people who I talk to who basically go, yeah, those ships could have done this, could have done that, and I'm listening and going... I can either be really cruel to you or I can be really nice. I'm going to choose to be nice because I, I, I can't. It's a choice I can make. I can choose to be a nice person today. And the nice person usually just goes, you really think so? I'm, well, that's interesting. But if I was feeling cruel, I could point out that they are old generation armored cruisers in many, many ways, and they are going to get bushwhacked by a Congo. And the rest of their force is going to have similar happen to them. Um, even if he gets into a fight similar to Henderson Airfield, the sheer number of IJN force in the area, he's not going to have a chance. And he doesn't have the scenario of Henderson Airfield. Um, Blabber Maximus, if Patron 86, would Sturdy have still been a contender for the ship if it was HMS Australia or the Congos that had sunk on spaceships? Um, no, but their commanders will probably be a contender for it. Um, Colin Cameron, does the book deliver a book delivery lorry have attached forklift for these pallets of books? Not joking, as these are actually a thing. Uh, it's we are likely going. We are quite literally going with um, uh, Pickfords, so we are quite literally getting the meme of British delivery companies. The company which has been going for freaking ever to do uh, to do our um, transport of our stuff. Uh, we had free tenders. I have to say I highly recommend Britannia. They were really really nice people. And Pickfords. And Pickfords can move everything, and are happy to move everything. Whereas Britannia were a bit worried about moving. My mum's classic car, and frankly, I, lo I, I love that car dearly. I had no wish to try and drive it all the way down to Cornwall. Before anyone asks, it's an MG1100 original, which my mum has owned since it was brand new. It is, my, it is more my mother's child than I am, 
and it is uh, it is in recent years it has only ever been out for occasional classic car races and local journeys. There is no way I am taking it anywhere near even the A303, let alone the A30, to get it down the corner. And I'm certainly not taking it anywhere near a motorway. Um, <laughs> just not happening. So uh, yeah, they 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 they're happy to take it. I am happy for them to take it. We are all happy. Nice um, Do we call the N3s the Yamatos and G3s the hours 20 years earlier more due to post-war perception, or is it a capability that they are referred to as a, than 20 years earlier? Uh, it's more a post-war perception, and it's something to make it easy for people to give a vision of in mind. Sometimes you use these analogies just to allow people to e more easily grasp what you're talking about. Because let's be honest, the N3s are not the Yamotos, they're not as fast as them. Uh, the Yamotos aren't fast battleships, but they're not as slow as an N3. Um... And the Iowas are fast battleships, and you can tell that by their subdivision, they're not battle cruisers. Whereas the G3s most certainly are battle cruisers. Oh, I have to do around the edges as well, don't I? I think we're going to move on to Lego now because I think that's my stretch I guess I've done for the day and before I do the rest it's going to require major reorganisation but I do need to write on this don't I Alex Mottis Books there. I've got four more boxes to go in here. I think I'm going to need to get some more. And um, there we go. There. And where did I put the screws down? Because I'm keeping them together. Oh, there they are. Right. Hello. Lego time, I think. So, on to that you go. Hello, everyone. Ay, oh, caramba. Let's catch up with the questions and then I'll start some Lego. Hey, hey, by God. Hello, down here. Hello, how are we doing? <laughs> da -da -dee. Ah, four, five. Always there. Um, have you provided for a fresh ship of cunning at Oxford? No, but I have taught the Future of War course at the summer school at Cambridge. And I was its lead professor. Or rather, lead academic. Um, which was fun. That was fun. Um, Henry Bofa, have you? No, Henry Bofa recently saw a study, ESA study for 36 knot seven battleship with uh, two quad 14 inch guns, XY quad 14 inch. How do you think? Do you think ships like this would have performed in World War Two instead of historical fleet? Um, ooh, they'd been fast enough to keep up with the carriers, but. They'd have probably been useful for bombardment. Would I really wanted to have taken one up against risk taking one up against an Iowa? That's a uh, I think it's Yamato. Uh, Yamato. Um, Yamato. Probably not. I probably wouldn't want to take one up against Yamato. 
So that that would be a more interesting thing how they would do. But it it could be it could be pushed through. Um, nice certain. How soon after the G3 class and the N3 class do you think Amblin Treasury starts to notice the spiraling cost of capital ships? What makes you think they haven't already noticed them? They already know that capital ships are costing money. But the trouble, the thing is, capital ships are cheaper to bit. It's cheaper to. Let's put it this way. Here is your cost. Keep up the tech race with the Americans and the Japanese. Or lose a tech race, potentially face a war versus the Japanese, and having to impossibly losing empire. Which costs more? The tech race? And keeping producing some battleships, which also provide employment and keep your yards going at the highest, highest efficiency and the highest knowledge? Or war? Which is cheaper? I think we all know the, the legacy of many scenarios. It's cheaper to keep the tech race going. And they worked that out and they knew that. And it's the same because it's when you see people going, and it costs how many, how many millions of pounds or how many hundreds of thousands of pounds, which is more closer to the action, did this missile cost to shoot down this 10k drone? And you go, well, yeah, but if that 10k drone had taken out, let's say, a, a tanker, how many millions upon hundreds of millions of pounds would that have cost? You're not building the ship because you're not you're not judging the thing by its cost of how much it costs to build it. You're costing you're judging that cost by how much it saves you in other costs. So building the ships is a lot cheaper than fighting a war. In a, in, ni in nicest way, there was a study produced, I think, by an academic post in the 1920s, which worked out if the British We Want Eight campaign had actually been successful the year before, and they'd ordered eight when they ordered the Queen Elizabeth class then that might have actually stopped World War I. I don't necessarily agree with that academic, but the idea was literally if Britain had raised not just the cost of doing business in terms of the number of ships, but, you know, the, the quality of ships, but also the cost of doing business in terms of the quantity of ships to the point at which it had broken the Germans, then the British, you know, the German, the Anglo-German naval race could have been over and... It changes World War One quite dramatically if the Germans aren't doing that. It changes some of the pressures. It changes how everyone acts when they're trying to negotiate things. So, Thompson, do you think if Stargate lasted longer, we would have got more random fleet of three or four, or three or threes, three or fours, and three or fives? Uh, I don't think we'd have seen more three or threes, but I think we could have seen something to back up the three or fours. I I could see something bigger than the three or four coming out. Peter Smith, Doug Clark, if you had a chance to remake any naval or naval war movies, which one and why? Okay, so here's the thing. I, there are things like the Battle of River Plate, which I would absolutely love to remake, but I wouldn't actually trust the modern filmmaking world to remake them because they, they'd want to add things in which would be wonderful to make the story more um, modern take on it, but it would actually ruin the history in it. And that's the thing. I love the history in it. But uh, there is the, there are several sort of things like the uh, there are sinking the Bismarck, etc. I'd love to redo that properly because I think with modern CGI you could really do something quite good with that. And you know, there's a few things around that which I would like to really work on. Because you know, I could just imagine it. They decide the reason that um, Ludendorff went to Montevideo was he had a secret girlfriend in South America or something like that would have to be written in by Hollywood to give the you know the right kind of love interest and all these things and you sit there and go no he didn't he was happily married he was a very decent man uh, on those fronts yes he was supporting Nazi Germany uh, but he wasn't actually one of the Nazis but he's doing that bidding so he is on the side of the bad guys he is therefore potentially a bad guy but the thing is he wa he wasn't the type to have an affair on his wife or something like that. And so you don't need to add that into the story. But the trouble is I wouldn't trust modern Hollywood not to do that. Steve Clark, at what point in the interwar does the practical idea of line of battle effectively end, despite what the admirals of the time still planning for it? Who were the admirals of the time who were still planning for it? This is the serious question. 
Look at the American exercise, fleet exercises, the British fleet exercises, the Japanese fleet exercises. Mm, they might be talking about battle line, as in the way the ships will probably form out to fight at the fire, because that way they don't interrupt with each other, etc. And don't silhouette each other. But the reality is, are we talking line of battle as in Matapan, where they were in a line? That's still used at Matapan, and it's still viable at Matapan. Or are we talking line of battle as in the huge whole fleet getting together rather than task forces? And I think what you're meaning is what time do we fit at what, at what point in the interwar era does it really stop being about major fleet engagements? We well, have to remember, even the Japanese was basically they would be doing attrition until they bring all their forces together and face whatever remained of the Americans having brought all their forces together, and that would be the big battle, the Kantai Kesson. Other than that, it's task force operations. And honestly, that's not a bad doctrine to have. It's just unlikely anyone's going to be that stupid enough to fall for it. Um, Malaga, if the treaties fail to happen and all the other attempts to stop the tech race also failed, how big do you think battleships, fast battleships and battle cruisers would have gone by 1939? How big? Well, that's an interesting question. How big would they have gotten by 1939? I think you could well be taught. I, I think they'd have probably settled into about 70,000 tons. I honestly do think it would have been about 70,000 tons. Um, I do think that would be the case. Uh, no, I'll put that into. But that's all good. And now I'm going to expand some cameras for you all. So this one's going to expand to cover the Lego area better. And this one's going to expand. So you can see me grimacing better. Lock everything else into place apart from those. And that goes to there. And that can go to there, so yeah. And then that's plenty of, uh, car, uh, it's plenty of space for the Lego. And then lock those in place. Right, so, if the treaties fail to happen, Malaga, if the treaty, all the attempts to stop the tech race also fail, how big, I'll answer that one, how big do I think they're getting for? They are getting for about 75,000 tons, I reckon. Uh, Black Marks, 1910, the Royal Navy suddenly finds several barrels and shells for the US 18 inch Mark 40, uh, 48 Mark 1 gun. On designs and structures, but no, I don't have any information on country or origin, what they do. Work on them, test them, see how good the idea is, see if they can, re uh, see if they can retro work them. Um, probably try and develop something base, uh, something using it in the future of their own technology. Hand it over to Ellsworth Ordnance Company. Uh, Jack Ray, why were two gun mounts developed more slowly for small uh, gun mounts? Two mounts, uh, gun mounts developed more slowly for smaller guns, like six inches below than large guns, because you're often expecting them to do more. And also, you often the weight limits are far tighter on a six inch and a four and a half inch or a four point seven inch or a five inch. The weight limits are going to be far far tighter than they are on the sixteen inch, or the twelve inch or the eight inch. Black Masters, what if the British had taken Alaska during the Crimean War and kept it? Canada would be bigger. That's literally it. Canada would be bigger. It would have been handed over to Canada. And as much as America might want it at that point, if it had been Canadian after the Crimean War, the odds are the Americans aren't going to do anything about it. They're not going to go to war over it. They haven't gone to war over other things. And 
Alaska would now be Canadian. So they, you know, reboot that. Uh, Frank Swanner, what ships in the DDI chain build that the British felt they needed to build a ship in response to? Um, honestly, there's nothing really until you get to Yamato. Uh, they're already sort of responding to Nagatos. That's that's part of the ongoing development. So that's what the end freeze and etc. are coming in about it. But mm, that sort of that's part of the tech race. That's not really a sort of uh, thing. So basically, each level of generation of the tech race is sort of building on each other and responding to each other. So it's a intermix of yeah, we're all responding to each other. Hollywood try to remember the size of historical movie. They they always try and stick weird or horror them romances in them. The amount of video, uh, amount of, but they they add in romances where they don't. They weren't romances. They just weren't. Um, we all remember Pearl Harbor, right? Don't we? Where they had that in a whole relationship. Um. No, sir. Would it be accurate or inaccurate to say the Yamato class at six five seven four thousand other practical limits of battleships? I think they could have gone bigger. I think they could have. I think you could have gone to a hundred thousand tons. Uh, I just think by the time you got to a hundred thousand tons, it's going to be a sincere question of what do we get for three hundred thousand ton ships? We don't get for four seventy five thousand ton ships. That's going to be the honest question. What does three hundred thousand ton ships buy us that four seventy five thousand ships don't buy us more of? That's the question. Um, it's a scaling thing. Mm. If the UK had sold off the Invincible class, considering they hadn't even built all the Invincible class by that point, yeah, but if they'd sold them off, uh, they were never going to sell them off. They were going to sell off Ark Royal, which was the, f uh, the third of the Invincible class, was the idea. Was I was going to sell maybe Invincible, and then after Ark Royal's come into service. But yeah, if the UK had sold them off, do you think they would have used submarines more to force the Argentinians to give the islands back? They could certainly have tried something with submarines, but honestly, you need air cover to try and get some troops in, so you've got Hermes. So basically, everything we depend on are Hermes, and Britain will be launching a crash carrier building program after the war. Which would be really interesting, because if Hermes has basically provided the carrier cover, and Britain hasn't had a carrier because they've sold it off, then their only argument they're going to be is, well, you know, the reason we didn't keep the Invincible class was they're not very good carriers, because they weren't big enough. So they're going to have to build something bigger than Hermes. And they're going to have to build at least three of them, if not four of them. So you could get some four very interesting vessels built. Uh, I'll probably see Harrier carriers again, but, you know, you would there would be a crash building program, kind of like there was for Type 22s to cover, replace Sheffield and Coventry. Um, and, you know, that that's... That would be what would happen. Sam Richards, in what period of time did the Royal Navy go from Galizia's type ships to the rated ships? Well, the Royal Navy very rarely had, didn't really have many Galizia's type ships. They never really had them. Uh, Henry VIII had a couple and all these things. They always had a, they had a couple dangling around for the channel work, but not really. Um, the Royal, the British always had uh, cogs and sailing ships. So they first go to frigate, uh, well, frigate built ships, uh, great ships, and all sorts of different interesting things. And slowly you see the rating system comes in really in the era of Stuarts. It's mainly under Charles II uh, to an extent, more under him than anyone else. Um, Peeps writes the first rating system, official rating system, but it's sort of been already been working around for a while before then, so Peeps codifies it. Magnus, why do so many people do seem to delight in dreams of dismantling the US? Eh, mostly it seems to be those people, those people like to have fantasies about all sorts of things. Honestly, you're talking to someone who ha who deals with people who have regular fantasies about apparently the Royal Navy had no aircraft carriers in World War Two, because they did only had battleships. And I'm literally sitting there going, "Have you heard of the Battle of Toronto? Yeah, that was an American carrier. A America wasn't in the war at the time. 
B, it was called HMS Illustrious. C, it was being flown by Swordfish, which are famously a British fleet air arm aircraft. And that's like, then they go, well, you say the Royal Navy had terrible aircraft. They're all World War One aircraft. And he's sitting there going, so either they have a carrier and have aircraft, which are terrible, or they don't have a carrier, in which case they couldn't have had aircraft, which were terrible. And also, they're not World War One vintage aircraft. But that is what I have to deal with on people's fantasies on a regular basis. So, people just wanting to dismantle the US, that's, that's mundane. Oy, it really is. I don't want that collapsing. I don't want that collapsing. There we go, that one. Don't collapse on me. Jenga. Hook Jenga. And yes, we have the Lego. We have the Lego. There we go. All right. Um, da -da -da -da. If, okay, Tim Richards, in what time period, answer that one, uh, Tim Richards, do you use Jane's Fighting Ships books for information? Uh, yes, um, Brassies, all sorts of books I use for information. Basically, if I can, if it's a reliable source of information at some point, I'll have used it. Okay. At some point, I will use it. All right, we have a book four. We have a pack two. We have a pack three. We have a pack one. We have two books, whole set of decals, tire stuff. Right then. So. And we have more decals. So, um, how am I going to do this? I know how I'm going to do this. Okay, for those who want this, uh, this vehicle to be built first, please put AMG in the chat. For those who want this one to be done first, put F1 in the chat. You have... Until I've got to... Knight 6841, question 16. So, uh, Leslie Mitchell, how much effort would it have been to upgrade the R-Class or to build a new ship, or to build a better build to new ships? Uh, Vanguard is an example of how much effort it would have required to build new ships, and... Um, effort, not that much. They could have done it. They could have done it, but it's a case of it's why do you want to do it? At the time when they're building it, they want to do is grow the fleet, not replace the fleet. And so that's what they're trying to do. That's what they're literally the Royal Navy's doing at that point. Uh, Henry Bofa, if small play drones placed in the silhouette of warships, would this be a good way of celebrating birthday of ships that are no longer with us? I would love to see it done. I'm not sure if it would be good or not, but I'd like to see it done just to see what it looks like. Uh, Frank's one, honestly, what is Stalin's best contribution to naval history, unironically? Best contribution to naval history? That the Soviet Union actually had a navy, because there were lots of number of people who didn't want one, and he actually kept it going. So, without him, there wouldn't have been a Soviet Navy. Without there being a Soviet Navy, there would have been lots of things very different. And I'm going to quickly move this while I get some iron brew out. I'm thirsty. It's thirsty. There we go. I doubt that'll be going back in.
Um, nice and all the phone number forty-four thousand tontosas keys and non thirteen plus mil. I think it's missing gaps between that gut and your motor. Yes, to an extent. Them and some of the other design studies, and they had lots of design studies. The Japanese do a lot of design work, keep a lot of design go work going, because that's how the Japanese function in many many ways. They keep their design work going and keep things fresh. It's how things work for them. And that was question 15. Staff Thompson, no clock. CV, uh, this should have been saved. Enterprise, Bonaventure, Hawaii. Um, Bonaventure, Hermes, Illustrious, and two of the great, uh, great, tra uh, great Lakes carriers, training carriers. That would be fun. <coughs> that would have been cool. Uh, Dr. C, Frank Smarter, what was something you need to find in one of your books that took you so long to find that in the room you don't have it at all? Um, that hasn't ever happened, but what has happened is I've ended up looking for something, haven't been able to find it, I've ended up ordering the book on Amazon as presumed I haven't found it, and then have literally bought the, got the book delivered from Amazon the next day, walked into this office with it, taken out this box, it's come in, put it down on its side, and then looked, and the book and the right next to it, which I just put it down on the side of, is the book I was looking for, and I've now got two copies. That's happened to me twice. Because I was sure I had the book, but I couldn't find it anywhere. That's, that's just that's just life, okay? That's just life. Um, Glamorous, could British warships during World War I uh, transit the Panama Canal before the America entered the war? Uh, there's a whole discussion on neutrality, but... Mm, I think one or two did make a transit, but they didn't really need to as a lot. Uh, need, need to a lot because you have to remember they don't really think in going that way around the world. It's going to sound strange. The British base system goes that way around the world, goes from east to uh, goes from um, goes eastwards around the world. It doesn't go westwards around the world. That's the British basing system. Everything set up going eastwards. I.e. Through the Mediterranean, through the sewers, through the Indian Ocean, da 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 da, and that's how they think in terms of a lot of operations. It's very rare they have they think through going through things through westwards. Uh, Black Mouse, could the British uh, warships dream one or uh, answer that one? Um, let's see. Ah, you found Lawrence Arabia. What do you recommend on books about him? Um, yes. And I cannot remember the title of the books, but they're in that box there. <laughs> uh, so you see that box down there, that one at the bottom, <laughs> they're in that one. So uh, ask me again in a few months' time, <laughs> I'll show you the books. Because <laughs> they came from the Middle East section, which was mm, in that... The disassembled, you see up there there's a disassembled um, Kallax, and that was in that. And I've got to disassemble all the Kallaxes in here. and I've got to basically pack this office up and turn it into, bo into boxes before I go. Because I won't have time between me getting back uh, me getting back and the, uh, the deliverer's row. Question 16. So what have we got as the winner before I answer it? Um, two AMGs, three F1s, four F1s, five F1s. Six F1s. F1s, I think, have it. It is the Lego shit cars. Yes. So. I need packs one and two. So three and four, off you go. And... Honestly, do not know which pack is which. I honestly have no idea. This one looks more like that. We'll see. We'll find out. We will find out. Pack one we have. At least this will not turn into a cruiser scenario. Um, so, question 16. Was the Super Dreadnought Battleship inevitable? Yes. Because they're just growing. It, it, it is always inevitable. 
The thing is, there's never going to be a cap placed on ships. It's going to change. It's like I was trying to explain with the Francesco Caracolla. They're not, they're not going to be a brilliant ship. It doesn't, it's always it's going to automatically be surpassed. They're not, the, the Italians knew that, and the Italians weren't building a ship which they thought would never be surpassed or something like that. No, they're building it for the status of having the first fast battleship. HMS Dreadnought, as I've said before, if the Royal, if Jackie Fisher had been prepared to wait a very small fun a while, he could have had a vessel armed with five triple turrets, 14 inch, gu 14 inch guns, uh, 14 inch 45. I think they're 14 inch 45s from Outlaw 6 Ordnance Company. And yeah, that would have rocked the world. And he could have probably achieved, could have probably, with the turbines and the pace of boiler of them, could have probably achieved 24 knots as well instead of 18. Um, instead, of 20, instead of 21, something, sorry. So basically, he could have had a 24 knot, a 24 knot, 15, 14 inch gun broadside. As his baseline dreadnought, but he wanted to get in the quit first because there is a prestige in being first, and so he does. But that is the scenario. That is what you end up with. You end up with HMS dreadnought as HMS dreadnought was. Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Yes, yeah, Seven Pillars of Wisdom is a very good one on Lawrence of Arabia. But, I would say one small fact about that, before we get in uh, too far into it, it is also just mildly biased and looking over some of the less nice things he does. Um, he is a very proficient military commander, and sadly enough, that is sometimes code for he does some things which, frankly... Uh, or rather, he allows some things to happen, which, frankly, you might prefer not him not to have done. And Seven Pounds of Wisdom tries to paint him as this kind of almost prophet-like figure, when he's not. He's a real human being. And that's one of the troubles for him uh, post-World War One is he's treated almost like this sort of mythical beast, and he actually isn't. He's a very good, very a a a independent soldier, and would have been really useful in World War Two. Would have been really useful. Right on, what are any new emojis your channel offers now? Um, they haven't gone live yet, but I have got about three ready to go. I spent some time the other day putting them together, and the trouble is it's getting them to the position which YouTube will allow you to upload them. So I do them, and I've got designs, and they are based on various cool ideas, I think. Um, I have to admit one of them is a Cornish pasty. Because we've already got beef wings on this channel, so it seems fine to have a Cornish pasty as well. Uh, it seems sensible. Why is there a head staring in the window at me? Hello, sister. I know who you are. Why are you staring in the window at me? You're just waving hello. Okay. At some point I need to remind her she's the elder sibling. Certain point. We'll leave that for another date. We'll leave that for another date. Um, so which colour is that? Is that the dark grey? I'd say that's the dark grey. That's certainly what it looks like. Um, but no, uh, it's it's um, that one's one, and I've got one coming, which I've got uh, one which is a. Um, Uh, one which is a fairy fulmar, because I thought that went down quite well. And the other one started out life as a Dauntless, but might actually end up becoming a, um, a Helldiver, because... <laughs> Look, th uh, this is going to sound terrible, and I do admit this is a slightly bad part of my personality. Uh, but I predicted and I said at the when I did the video did the recordings I said there are going to be people who don't like this 
And I advise them to just not watch it, because if they're happy with the way the world is and they want it all to just be one way, then, you know, they should leave it be and they should just go off and be happy. But they didn't. They watched the chat and watched the video. And they didn't like it. And I wasn't surprised they didn't like it. And um, some of them have put some very interesting things down there. And I, I, I didn't, I, I haven't had the heart to respond yet. I might actually do a comment response video for that chat of that video. Because almost I think I need to. Because um, there are some people who got quite so worked up about it. And I mean truly apoplectically worked up about it. You can go and see some of the responses. Uh, I'm not quite sure why they decided that um, the right response, the response that would change my mind, would be quite so vitriolic. And I have on that through, of course, you know, with my channel, as I said before, because my little cousin's watching. It has some fairly strict things when it comes to swear words. Okay? It's, um... It, it, it's it's not there to, you know, interfere with anyone. It's, you know, or prevent anyone expressing an opinion. They're able to express your opinion. You're able to disagree with me. I'm happy for you to disagree with me if you want to. But the thing is, swear words are blocked for obvious reasons. Although I did notice that occasionally they do seem to get through still. So, you know, joy of the world that one is. But... Most of these were actually blocked, and I do not understand why they felt that swearing at me was going to change my opinion of the Helldiver. I also found it interesting that they were using opinions which, as I point out, consistently come from the people flying the aircraft in 1943, and not the people who came from 1944 or 45. And, yeah, basically it was a, it was a bit of an interesting time, that one. So, um, Black Masters, what could the UK have done to fix or at least to better than they did original time on the economy post-war into the fifties? Uh, structural investment into a lot of lot of infrastructure, a lot of investment in infrastructure and science and technology, and um, they were rebuilding. But also the trouble is. They really needed to be more prepared for the shock, which was the Americans changing the economic system on them overnight. They just weren't expecting it. And, um, yeah, that, that mucked them up. It mucked them up good. It mucked them up really good. Um, question 17, Knights of for 1. Uh, if the British in their early Super Dreadnought run went with 4 Orion to 5 1911 King George V to 5 Iron Duke, would 6 Queen Elizabeth and 8 Rs make more sense than uh, after a run of 444? It would certainly make more of a um, <laughs> logical version. What was that? Sound alerts are turned off on Twitch. Okay. Was that someone signing up to Twitch or something? Why does it do that sometimes? Okay, that's off. I love that people are now following my Twitch channel. I do not like it when my computer does ghost shots at me. <laughs> it, 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 I've left Twitch on again. Yeah, that, that's what I'm... Has Karen shot someone? No. She she was taught to my, uh, by my mother. She's perfectly very... She's very capable when it comes to um, utilising a silencer. I'm fairly certain. Um... In other words, you wouldn't hear it, so don't try it. Where am I look? I'm looking for something. I'm looking for something very small and very unique. Apparently. 
And if anyone know, knows what it is, then they are smarter than me. There it is. So. This is where sometimes they do get quite... They've got the full... I don't know if I've seen it. Ha like, handle. For it. It's quite cool. That is quite cool. And we want to put that in there. And then we want to put this here. Oh, that's effective. Um, could the German Empire have gone for a tech nail race to uh, maintain a more friendly relationship with the UK? Yes, they could have done. They could have done gone for a tech race. Um, they could have also built more, more balanced fleet that way. Black Mama says, if we want a campaign comes earlier for the Q lizards instead and they are the small tube boilers to get 28 knots, would the German fleet even try to come out and try to catch the Royal Navy Battle Cruisers? Well, it depends. If the vessels that succeed them have also done that, um, then you have a very different navy. If you have... Uh, the, the Queen Elizabeth at that point would be quite a powerful and very scary force. Uh, a very potent scary force and I mean huge fight in the British forces. Again, I can actually... I'm going to switch something. So... No. There we go. If I go to win this capture. Now, with this one, um, interestingly enough, that was one of the things which Knights of the Everyone brought up. And so I have discussed this quite recently and I've got the stats. The Francisco Caracoa class had 20 Yarrow Star small tube boilers. Now, I looked up the details for the Yarrow Star boilers, and they did have an earlier. This is plan. The Caracolas are about 19. They're a 1914, 1915 design. Yarrow have a similar design to this going around in about 1912. So this is the option. It is, I don't think the original versions were quite as efficient. So I'm not sure. But originally Queen Elizabeth had 24 large tube boilers. Um, the small tube boilers of the Yarrow were offering were slightly lighter than that. But I don't think they're quite as efficient as they necessarily are for the Caracola class. Uh, so... That produces 126,000 shaft horsepower in theory if you just do a one-to-one -one swap for the boilers. Um, which I think definitely gets them 28 knots. Um, originally, they have 75,000 shaft horsepower, and the Caracolas have 105,000 shaft horsepower to get them to it. I wouldn't be surprised if the earlier boilers in you know, 24 probably gets you closer to 100,000 shaft horsepower. I'm, I'm going to say that. But I still think that might be enough to get them to the twenty-eight knot, uh, to the twenty-eight knots, or close enough that they are near enough that they're near enough there. But remember, they are slightly, f they are actually f less beam, but they are, and they are actually better on the length to beam ratio in some ways than the Caracolas. But they actually might need to be built slightly longer. But again, if you are building them and already you've got the power to get there, it's worthwhile adding on an extra few feet of a few feet of length to get you, and that's just going to give you more space. So, yeah, that's something I think they can do. But there you go. There was some uh, back of the uh, brain cell working out on, ma on some maths that are going on there in the response. And before anyone asks, that's why I do like Knight's comments. And I do tend to respond to them. Although I do not like it when people su uh, suggest myth I'm using myths. Because here's the thing, Knight. As I pointed out. About the only historian who says that about them, so it's not a myth. So no, it's my argument I'm making. I haven't yet to see. If it was Andrew Lambert named the only one making it, then you could argue he was making a myth because he's got the status too. So you're either suggesting that I am an academic history god, in which case that's actually a compliment, and I'll take that. Uh, or alternatively, no, you're over. You are grossly overstating it. If it's just my opinion, you can say it's your argument. It's not a myth. It's an argument I am making. I don't think anyone else makes that argument. Because mostly people just look at the stats and they just go, it's Italy, so yeah, their economy and all these things. And those are perfectly reasonable arguments to make. But the point is, as I was saying, 
if they built it and it comes into service first, it will be the first fast battleship in service. And if they achieve that, there is a status in that which is going to achieve the things. It's the same reason France operates the Charles de Gaulle. It's a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. It might not be a great aircraft carrier, but it is a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, and that's part of Charter France's status in the world. And, you know, that's the reality. Sometimes, literally, image does matter. And sometimes, image, sadly enough, has more of a bearing than it should probably do. Oh, so that goes into that. <laughs> and I've got that. That looks like that piece to me. But I need to put in that. And then I need to put it in that. Yeah, that looks quite cute. And then I need... Oh, I haven't. I have seen that piece. Yeah, there's that one. That. That. That's gone wrong. That's right. Yeah, and I think I'm not mistaken. That's gonna stick into that. Just gonna guess. Oh, what do you know? Well, there's a little bit of building up first, but yeah, otherwise it does. So. No, if the Canon class heavy cruisers had 234mm guns and were 15.5 to 18,000 tons, what do Churchill's supercruisers become as a result? <sighs> Probably 25 to 30,000 ton vessels. Um, honestly, whatever fantasy he's cocking up, he, he's, um, mm, cro he's uh, cooking up. He, he does have lovely ideas, that man. He does have lovely ideas. Eh, they're not all bad. It's just... As said, I find his, some of his early decision-making is straight out of World War One. It's a case of, this is what we did in World War One. It's not necessarily the right thing to do in World War Two, But it's what I did the last time. And it, it didn't go horribly wrong. It did go horribly wrong in so many ways. Um, so, so many ways. So, so many ways. Um, okay. So you've got, okay, I accept the task of experiment replacing the massive fleet on engagement strategy. Is this based on reduction in naval forces as a result of treaties? It's based on the reality of wars. Basically, one of the scenarios at the moment, you've also got, you've got the reduction in forces in a certain sense, but you also, you've got to cover far larger areas. If you consider there's a uniqueness to Anglo-German war, it's a very confined battle space, it's North Sea. Compare it to a war between Britain and Japan, or America and Japan, and or Britain and America, that's going to be vast, quite a vast, vast expanse of oceans. There's a reason why the ones who abandoned it last as a sort of doctrine are the Italians and the French fighting in the Mediterranean. It's confined scenarios. 
Alex, Steve Clark, Alex, your mum is the character Helen Mirren is based on in red. Don't get me started on that one. She's scary enough as it is. Do not add that to her repertoire. Do not add that to her repertoire. She is scary enough as it is. That's a uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Mm -hmm. um, what if the first London Naval, Naval Treaty had limited destroyers to 2,000 tons but no cumulative limit? The Royal Navy would be been excessively happy and they'd have been building about... Oh, probably 18 destroyers a year, very happily every year thereafter. Um, it would have been a really good idea for Royal Navy, and probably a few, uh, probably a few others as well would have done that. But I, I doubt so many would have built as many as the Royal Navy would have. Um, the Royal Navy would have really gone right then. So we can build as many destroyers as we like. We can build as many. Um, Um, destroyers and sloops as we like, so we build as many destroyers and sloops as we like, and we keep building them because that's going to be our force strength. That's going to be our capability to deal with problems. And that's really the scenario you're talking about. You know, that's their, that's their ability to deal with problems is that force strength. Save it around. Um, nine, uh, sorry, the eighteenth question also included guns as well. Uh, if treasure were two hundred thirty-four millimeter guns, um, so basically your uh, the question is if they're nine point two inch guns. <sighs> That's roughly two. Mm, yeah. Um, Churchill Super Cruise has become 12 inch gun cruise ships or 14 inch possibly. But yeah, they they just they, they just become massive. They might well they might keep the 9.2 inch guns, they might not. It's gonna depend on what kind of mood he's in. And what kind of feelings he's got going on. And I guess this is what I'm gonna need for the next one. Oh, I need those actually. Yep. Mm-hmm. I now need that, or is it that? Oh, they're both the same, so I definitely need one of them. Um, da -da -da -da. Like most, if you had full control of producing a movie based on naval battle with a budget of 500 million see, what would you do at the top, be your top five figures, picks? I had full control. Um... Battle of the River Plate, Battle of Tsushima, Battle of Trafalgar. That's very obvious ones. Okay, that's obvious. Um, Matapan, I'd like to do. And the only reason I haven't picked American ones is they've done them quite recently. So let's be honest, they've done them quite recently. And so, frankly, as much as I would like to do those ones again, I feel they've already been done more recently. So I would like to do other ones first. So it's, this is top five. Um, so I've done Matapan, Trafalgar... Done Battle of the River Plate. Do I want to do Taranto? It's mostly going to be people flying cold, you know, aircraft. Um, probably can't do. To, uh, probably Taranto doesn't make that great a movie. Um, there's not enough going on in terms of that. It's a great dramatic point, but actually, no. Yeah, I could make and the way I can make Taranto. It would be an absolutely gorgeous movie, but it would take its entire cue from gravity. I mean, literally, it would be all focused on, like, two people. And that would be a one air crew, one bomber crew, uh, one torpedo bomber, the whole way through. And I'd probably pick the ones who were the last back. 
and they're basically thinking that they're all alone and you can just basically hear them you know them they're, they're all thinking about their friends and all their their squadron mates and thinking that they're all dead and have that scene as the end of the movie where they literally are taken down into the hangar and they see all the rows of aircraft and just end on the emotions on their faces as they realize that they aren't the only ones who got back yeah that that would be that would be an absolute that would win an oscar let's be honest that would make everyone cry I could probably use Tom Hardy for that as well. And I and Patrick Stewart. I could use Patrick Stewart as a grizzled admiral. He could hand that up quite happily. Yeah. Um Banhome, let's say you travel back in time. What happened to men up working under Admiral Henderson making the travel class? What free changes do you make? I get the four and a half dual purpose mount fixed. Uh, I, I get the dual purpose or the 4.7 dual purpose. Either way, I get and insist on getting them done. If I'm making the tribal class, that's the big thing I'm going to do. Um, actually have a proper system of storing spare torpedoes put in rather than the ad hoc system, which I now 100% certain was used. I cannot prove it, but after talking with crews from the Canadian ones who'd worked with their World War II buddies... Yeah, I'm absolutely certain they where they tied down. They had they they had some tie down points anywhere there, which they use for loading the torpedoes. And the loading process, and I think they loaded extra torpedoes into those tie down points and held them on there until they needed them. So that's where the extra torpedoes come from came from, and that's probably the same system which the British were using. So it makes sense. So I'm a, as sure as you can be without being able to actually physically prove it, because I can't find a single person giving them an account of them doing that, an official document. Which doesn't really surprise me, but it's really annoying. Um, and what else would I do? I'd probably see if I could replace the Vickers machine guns with more 40mm pom-poms. Uh, pom um, that would be my attempt to replace something. That'd be what I'd be so I'd be doing, yeah. Um, so that's my free changes. Nice, Aaron. Would I be right that the Frieder Fingers said let's two mark her class and one von Tang not for Germany's colonial empire? No, they're not enough for Germany's colonial empire. But they're also in a way too much because they're too short legged. They're not really what you want. The, the German battle cruisers were not really what you want to deploy around the world. <sighs> Supporting them outside of Germany was a nightmare. Just ask the Ottomans. Just ask the Ottomans. Okay. So now I have to figure out which is which. I think he says, I think this is the right one. I think that's the right one. I think that was the right one. So, what's the next question? Uh, what is Black Marks? What is the most expensive book you own? Um. Some of the naval architecture books I own are really, really expensive. Uh, the original edition Norman, Fre the most most expensive book I own, which is currently in publication, in is the Norman Freeman's 
um, British aircraft carriers, which I bought an original version of when I was doing my um, when I was doing my bachelor's. And at the time, it cost me, and I worked this out, it cost me 96 hours work. And I was on £15 an hour as an IT technician. So it cost me, this is back in 2006-ish. Uh, it cost me fourteen hundred and forty pounds. That's not the most expensive book I own. That's the most expensive book I ever bought at the time. I uh, don't think it's worth that. I don't know how much it's worth now. At the time, they were really, really rare, and I really needed it, and I had the money because whilst I normally worked three days a week for as an IT technician, it was summer, we were doing a massive, massive university overhaul, a massive uh, university-wide overhaul. Instead of bringing outside contractors to it, they basically turned around to all the part-timers like me and said, would you like a massive overtime? And so for a month in the summer, I was working 12 hours a day at university on that rate, six days a week for four weeks. So you can A, imagine the money I made on that time because I literally worked 72 hours a week uh, for four weeks. And I was bringing home 15 pounds an hour before tax. So yeah, I did 288 hours that month, and yeah, so that month I that month I bought myself the Norman Freeman book, and um, my mother looked at me afterwards and went, "You must be nuts." I went, eh, "I'm not disagreeing with that one. I don't disagree with you as a rule when it comes to any, uh, when it comes to anything. I'm far too sensible to do that." And um, that. And then I want to get that. And then another one of those. And that. It's a nice little joke about the fact that they mother could brought them in as well, they could take them out on the world. I really do think mine could. Okay. Marganus, what happens to the Soviet Navy if Trotsky, champion of world revolution, takes power instead of Stalin? The Soviet Navy probably grows dramatically because if he wants to do world revolution, the best way to export the, around the world is to have a navy to do so. So, um, yeah, that, that's going to be an interesting time, but he will probably end up having to do that. If he wants to export the revolution around the world, he will need a navy to do export revolution because that is the only way you can really export revolution is if you have a navy to do so. Uh, da, 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 da. There you go. And number 18. Um, Call of Duty Black Ops. If um, Henry Ruffo. Henry Sword was made into a modern to carry using stealth, surprise, hacking the radar as. How, do, uh, how many would it take to do a successful boarding? Um, okay, so. A, you're going to have a lot of people aboard a ship. A lot of people looking out for things. But let's say you do successfully board a ship. You've got to seize control and maintain control of about three areas. If you're talking about an American carrier, you're talking a crew of roughly 5,000. Roughly, give or take. A British carrier, you're talking about a crew of 800. So there's a slight difference there in what you're dealing with in terms of scale of opposition. But, and this is the big... Glorious Glutamus Maximus of it all. These people are not going to take this lying down. None of them are. 
Um, you have to control engineering. You have to control the flight deck. Because if they get an aircraft off, you're in trouble. And you have to control the command and information system. And you have to control the bridge. And in that means, in the British carriers, you have to control both towers. You have to take both towers by surprise. Remember, they are crewed 24 hours a day. They're a bit look out, looking at them. So, how nicest way get, you're not coming over the deck, and then saying you're coming, you're having to somehow come in and sneak on from the far side. So that means you've got to get through the hangar area or the. Well, actually, no. Hang on. You've got to get up there to there. You've got to get through the hangar space without being spotted. You've got to. It's it's an absolute nightmare. But let's say you do it, and let's say you do manage to get control of the ship, you are probably going to need a few dozen, a dozen or so people in each area to actually maintain control of it. And they're going to be well armed and need to be well armed and well provisioned because there are lots of people coming for you, especially on the American carrier. And the American carrier is even worse because they're nuclear powered. They do tend to have really secure protocols around their engine room spaces, which don't even allow all their people in there. So um, to get into them is fun. And that's about as much detail as I'm prepared to go on with that one. Uh, uh, Ace Pilot. Hello, Ace Pilot. 2004. I don't think I've seen a comment from you before, but hello. Uh, welcome to the chat. Have you enjoying it? Um, if the British Wilhelm Southern Air Raid dropped in 19, happened in 1919 and was successful, what impact would there be on the navies in 1920 and beyond? Uh, if the air raid had happened and been successful, you can expect a massive carrier construction project. In the nicest way, if a carrier raid has just sunk a significant portion of the German fleet and forced them to come out, uh, that is going to make several people very, very interested in the concept of aircraft carriers. And that is going to have an impact on what happens next. So, yeah, that, that's basically the scenario you're going to be dealing with is a lot of people being very, very interested in aircraft carriers. And... With them interested in aircraft carriers, they're probably going to build them. So you could actually see carriers part of the programs of construction in 1920. If the you know if the if the raid happened in 1918, they'd have probably be had carriers uh, already some sort of fleet carriers under construction by the time World War or the London Treaty happens, uh, Washington Treaty happens. I mean, far more than they did. Uh, Frank, Doug C, would you ever sell complete models and sign them for a live stream, maybe a charity stream? I'd have to see what the circumstances were. I'm just, as I said, with the book is the first time, the book competition is the first time I've done sort of gifts away for and done them myself and sort out rather than contracting out to another company to do it because I was a bit worried about doing it and there's not really the space to do it here. And this is another advantage with the move. There's going to be a, a space, a room which I can use for those things. It's also going to be my spare room for people that come to stay. We'll leave it to one side. Um, so far, the only people who've been offered to come to stay there are ship shape crew, so they should be understanding of it. <laughs> Hopefully, Dan's not watching. Otherwise, he's going to get squished. We'll leave that to one side. And now we start off with the same building process again in reverse. But yeah, so theoretically, if some were generally interested, genuinely interested in me doing so, and if I thought it would actually raise money for people, and yeah, I might do it for charity. All right. Uh, honestly, I do Lego building as a way of relaxing, so I wouldn't claim to be the best or anything at it. It's just something I do, and I like to do because, I said, it relaxes me. <laughs> it, it, it's something I do which doesn't require me. It doesn't sort of uh, try to add to my stress in the day.
there are lots of things which do seem to want to add a mass stress in a day, but um, not this, thankfully. Not this. Right, so, uh, question 20. If the Royal Navy got 450 Canadian car and foundry as the BW1B held overs, where would they have been used? Uh, okay, so here was the problem for the Royal Navy, and this is, as I said, in the held over thing. The Royal Navy, by the time you're getting the held over, don't think dive bombing is a practical, vi is a viable option anymore. The answer to where would they have been used? Probably Pacific Fleet, etc. And Indian Ocean and that sort of thing to get the strength of forces. But honestly, they are not that keen on that. But this is the thing: is this is one of the things. Dive bombing starts off World War II as being this really sought-after capability. But after a while, it gets taken over by well, we've got rockets which can provide precision, a far lot easier and a lot safer for the uh, the air crew. And do we really want to risk all these vital people and these vital uh, skilled aircraft doing this kind of operation? We d the answer is no, you don't. And if you don't, then you don't do that. And if you don't do that, then the trouble is for a dedicated dive bomber is its value becomes a lot less because, well, it's a dedicated dive bomber. It basically becomes, oh, this is a bomber. Okay, well, the Grom is a better bomber because it can carry a lot more bombs further. Okay, that's kind of annoying. How are we going to win this one? Well, you can't. You, you, you've basically... Uh, where do I put this? You shoot yourself in the foot the moment you get into this scenario because you are building a custom purpose, purpose-built die bomber that's built to, as said, a reworked 1930s metric. And it's very good by that metric. It's just that metric is not valid the moment you get into the war. And this is... Uh, they're not valid by the time it enters the war, and that's what causes half the issues and half the problems with it. But it's, you know, the thing is, it's not designed for the current war you're in. And I do love the amount of people who keep using... Look, if you want to go see a con, which is quite funny, and again, I've seen variations of it, but this is the one person who actually put it through without swearing, is the amount of people who suggested that Curtis bribed the US Navy, to put the Helldiver into service to replace the Dauntless. Here is the reality, and I want to ask chat this seriously. How much money do you think it would take to bribe Admiral King? Because he's the head of the Bureau of Aeronautics when they start to put, uh, start the process towards the Curtis uh, Helldiver. And he's then the Chief Naval Officer, the CNO, when they're putting into service. So... Can you please tell me how much money, under what circumstances, you think Curtis could actually bribe Admiral King? Because I've heard many suggestions, but that one took the absolute biscuits every time I saw it. Because I was sitting there going, you obviously haven't bothered to research who was the person they've had to bribe at this time. Because I think the chances of successfully bribing Admiral King are not great. But I will be, I will be persuaded if there's, someone can put a persuasion in chat... Do you think Admiral King could be successfully bribed by Curtis and how much it would take? I will be, you know, duly impressed if you can explain to me that Kurt, in a, give me a logical argument for King taking a bribe from anyone. I'm glad Easter cake is good. Ah, uh, Tanif. Time is flying by. No, it's 10 o'clock. I didn't realise it got so quite so much for myself either, but, you know, it's fun. Yeah, da 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 Mm 
Didn't King King did take well, did take flying lessons? Yes. Um. King was king. Again, if anyone could provide me with a legitimate argument for him, how much it would cost to bribe Admiral King, I'd be really interested in the entire country. He <laughs> um, there's, there's a few lols coming through. There's so far, no one's... But this, this is the point. When someone says this to me, this is why I find them hard to really respond to. Because I'm just going, you've done absolutely no research at all. How much money... To bribe Admiral King, good luck. If you still had limbs attached after you started out the con uh, dis uh, the, the discussion, I'd be surprised. If you were able to breathe, I'd be even more impressed. The only answer to that one would be you ran very, very quickly. You basically said it while running out the door, and perhaps it took him a while to process what you actually said. More than 50p. A lot more than 50p. <laughs> oh. Free milkshakes, no more than last. <laughs> oh. Okay. Only the Brian Bluna Cane box man can say not even then. <laughs> Yeah, if you got a cage box match with um, with Beady, maybe maybe you could swing it, but I I I still doubt it happens. You know, I I, I you know, it just I'm just looking again. You obviously have done no reading of this topic at all. No, Admiral King, I I I, I, I how much would you take for me to do that? No. Just do not see that happening. King taking a bribe. Yeah. The permanently angry man having something else to be angry about. Yes. He was incredibly even-tempered. He was angry all the time. Yeah. Ay, caramba. <laughs> oh. Right, so Mark Arthur challenged him to whoever, whoever has the greatest, the greatest prime has got all of this. <laughs> King was a very, very interesting guy. And a very capable guy. So I don't think he would take a bribe. Um, Rinon, how much merit do you ascribe to the loose, let's say, you used to say, seemingly new model 2 and some of the small squad level war crimes made? Um, I would say that, frankly, look, you are asking people to do a lot, and sometimes there is a great attraction in trying to make things easier for those people doing them. And the trouble is, once you start using things like that, like those simulants, you lose control of people because they lose control them. They lose themselves. Um, it's um, it, it's one of the scenarios that I often find myself discussing with people is the exact, you know, why do some people, you know, why do some people not take stimulants and some people do. The answer normally comes down to how much of a control freak are you? And the thing is, it's it's a way to feel like you're letting go of control. And for a certain type of personality, that's a great thing. That's something they love the idea of. And for other type of personalities, that is their absolute worst nightmare. And for even worse scenario is it makes some personalities feel like they're more in control when they're on those chemicals when they're not, because they're not them. Uh, 
And that's a real problem. It's like the Stinkers advert. You're not you when you're hungry. Well, you aren't you when you're on drugs. You aren't you when you're in chemically imbalanced symptoms at all thing, uh, the scenarios. Um, people usually don't co 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 commit the same level of atrocities they do when they're hungry as they do when they're high on drugs, but it's still not a good scenario. Not a good scenario at all. Why I couldn't have done that earlier, I do not know. It would have made me so much happier, and it would have got rid of those four pieces quite quickly. I don't know. Hmm. We have these bits. Where do these bits go? Oh, they both go here. And curve bits go on the end bit. Um, Frank Spider, Lawrence of Labour versus Paul von Lettel Vorbeck. Um, I would prefer to be with Lawrence than Paul. I'd have a slightly cleaner soul. But uh, both had an interesting war. Oh, open number two. Okay, so these must be spare pieces. It's always nice when you have a load of spare pieces left over and you're going... What are these for? They appear to be spare bits for small parts which I might have had to use. Uh, how much impact does an avalized P51 make if deployed to USN CVs eight, uh, CVs eight months before Pearl? Um, if they've got a navalized P51, that's an interesting aircraft for dealing with zeros. That's an interesting aircraft for air, air defense of the fleet, and basically it's an interesting aircraft full stop. So uh, let's put it this way. I wouldn't say no to it. But I prefer a Hellcat delivered earlier, because that's more what you're looking for for a naval aircraft. I can understand where you're coming from, I can accept it, but I prefer the Hellcat earlier than the P-51 in its navalized form at that time. It's more fits with what I need to do. Uh, Night by Maximus, October 1st, 1959. All the Royal Navy carriers are turning into midway class carriers. All capital ship yards mobile dark has expanded to fit them. What changes? Um, okay, so the midways aren't exactly what the Royal Navy would want, that would be the Malta, but it's also not exactly bad, considering they're a kind of hybrid between the Ark Royal in terms of size and the Illustrious class in terms of some armouring, and so they're not like the Essex's class, I would actually be able to be happy to take a midway into the Mediterranean. So leaving that to one, all to one side, what happens? The Royal Navy has a lot, very fun time. Because if you think about it, the Royal Navy in October 1939 still has courageous, glorious Ark Royal. Illustrious is coming, so maybe we count her as well. Um, Furious, Eagle, Hermes, Argus. Eight Midways makes the Royal Navy a very happy navy. In 19, October 1939, uh, you have combined carrier ops going what the wazoo. Basically, they're on they're non-stop going to be happening up. Um, when you have Force H form, that's going to be perfectly fine. You're going to be able to take more aircraft. The question is, are they going to get enough aircraft for them? If they're not, they might start ordering ordering from the Americans even earlier. Um, If you get a full midway, if you get a full a full Royal Navy air group from the same time period as the midways come, well then the Royal Navy be really really ecstatic. But pretty much what they do with them, well, imagine Taranto if carried out by two midways stocked full of swordfish. The main problem the Royal Navy would have them, although hang on no, the midways had the improved American fuel to fuel system, which took the idea, which borrowed some of the ideas from the illustrious class and how the British managed it. So, rather than what they put in the escort carriers, which was their first generation, and similar to what was going into the Essexes and the light carry, light fleet carriers. Um, so, yeah. Actually, they'd probably be very happy with them. Would have been as happy as they would have been with a load of Maltos? No, but they'd still be happy with them. Still be very happy with them. Um, 
make sure the tread's right. Okay. Um, Knights of for one. Was the Curtis SBC21 based CCF too big for Royal Navy carriers? No. It was not. Those same carriers could fit the Grom Avenger quite happily. I have seen all sorts of twaddle spoken about the Curtis Helldiver. Especially in my comments recently. And I... Find them funny. Um, as pilot, what would be better for 1939 to 1930s and 1940 navies and multiple small carriers, or a single fleet carrier? Assuming no treaty on both these. If you've got no treaty limit, but you can only build one fleet carrier or lots of small fleet carriers, it's going to be just small fleet carriers, because it's going to be the number of hulls. Okay, it's going to be the hulls, especially for the Royal Navy and the US Navy, etc. If, let's say, you had a scenario, and this I have done a discussion of in the treaties, whereby you were allowed to build your aircraft carriers up to 30,000 tons for a full fleet carrier, and you were allowed 15 carriers, let's say, 15,000 tons and below, were allowed as well as a light fleet carrier and there was no limit on how many light fleet carriers you could build or something like that they would have been happily building away and they would have been a nice little race or if you'd set the limit up so that let's say the British and Americans could each build 150,000 tons of fleet carrier and 150,000 tons of light fleet carrier starters then both navies would have been happy but also both navies would have built 30,000 ton fleet carriers five of them and a 10 15,000 ton light fleet carriers and gone woohoo we rock your world so now that's done let's hunt that piece of uh, that piece of component but yeah um, okay. Make sure, please debunk an uncommon myth that annoys you. Uncommon myth. Oh. One of the weirdest myths I've come across. One of the weirdest myths I've come across. And this one, this one I've, ha I, I, I've had a really interesting fun with yeah, recently was that the... I think it was, was it? The Zero is it was a copy of the Spitfire, which was badly translated, which is why the Zero came about like it did. And that was just so it's so easy to disprove. A, it's completely different techniques of construction, different shapes, different engine, a different design, entirely, completely different. But pretty much the amount of times you will read in various works, in, and these are including books by some, uh, some very good historians who are just writing what they have you know down, down it quickly because it's an aside in their book it's not the main thing they're talking about they're usually economic and political historians various ideas of where the zero came from and you still go no no it, it was not something which was randomly produced by the japanese based on what someone else had made it's their entire their own design they are they are more than capable of doing their own work they don't need to copy off other people's and you just, yeah, that, the the amount of different things which come out on the on the zero, it's. And the thing is, people go, they go from the weirdest things. They go, well, the Japanese bought copies of this aircraft and this aircraft from America or from Britain or from Germany, and they did. And you go, well, look, the Americans bought copies of this aircraft and the British bought copies of this aircraft from Japan and this aircraft, etc. They were all doing it. It was perfectly common at the time for you to buy variations of aircraft produced by other nations to evaluate and consider and compare against your own. It's what they all did. And I literally mean they all did. And you can argue about how smart that was to do. I think it was quite smart to do because it allows you to have a look into 
what the, uh, your opponents are doing, how they're developing, and to think about it. But um, some people say, oh, no, no, that's... that's uh, you, because you have to, you are like buying theirs. You have to let them buy yours. And you go, yes, they're buying foreign variants, just like you're buying foreign variants of their stuff. It's it it works. It works after a fashion. It's about as sensible as that ever going to be. Um, that was how would it change things if the Royal Navy started to design a light cruisers after the Q and Elizabeth main gun layout? I think you're meaning earlier in World War One if they'd gone with that style um, from the begin uh, from the moment the Queen Elizabeth came in. How does it change things? If the Royal Navies have got a uh, Royal Navy's got that used to doing twin turret design, uh, goodness knows what they've grown up to and what their guns have got up to. Um, you probably actually start more with a King George V five turret layout or. or uh, maybe a Tiger class five gun layout than you would a Queen Elizabeth class, but things would be interesting, and they'd be very well versed in turret design uh, for the uh, for cruisers by the end of the war, and it would probably change pretty much everyone else's approach to light cruisers as well. You would be more be interesting to see what happens with guns because I think honestly, if they're going down to twin, twin turret routes and pushing up like that. I think of, I think you auto, almost inevitably have a growth in the turret margin, which means you might get the seven and a half inch earlier, which means you might well push onto nine point two inch guns earlier. In which case you could have a uh, nine point two inch gun carrier produced quite early on. Now, what am I looking for? I'm looking for one of those corner ones. And a few seconds ago, I had tons of them in front of me. And now when I want one, it's just they all disappeared. In the... Ah, there it is. There is one. In the universal history of the world, this is what happens. The moment you want something, it's not in front of you. It disappears. That's the wrong one. That's the right one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's the right one as well. Okay. Okay. Um Night Sigur everyone. Question twenty two. How much did the sixth of October nineteen forty four crash the Helldiver Mark one J one two PSL sound former range in Lancashire? Loss of both crew affect the Royal Navy's decision to reject Helldiver. They'd already got there. I said, nicest way, but it was already decided long before they got them. Royal Navy took delivery of its test ones when uh, we can use these as tugs and things, but we don't need a dive bomb. We don't need that job. We have other aircraft doing roles which cover that that required the targeting mission required from that, and frankly, we don't need it. One of the things you find about the Royal Navy is very early on, they get ruthlessly efficient when it comes to the idea of logistics. They don't want anything they don't need on their carriers, and they want to maximize the capabilities they have available on their carriers. Which means, they will say no on a regular basis if they have to. They will say no all day long if they have to, because they don't need it. So they don't get it. You might sit there and go, but, 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 no, they don't want it. They don't need it. It's not useful for them at that time. There are other things they need more. And those things they will go for, but they will make, a, they will make an assessment as to what they need. And it's just that simple.
And I've had this discussion with people who gone, but uh, they could have, they would have, no, they didn't want it. The, the honest answer is they took a look at it, they thought, hmm, this is cute, but it doesn't give us anything we need. Because by that point, and that's the really important thing, by that point, they didn't need it. They need, what they needed at that point were strike aircraft, yes. But the strike aircraft could be Corsairs, they could be Hellcats, they were carrying rockets. They didn't need a dive bomber to do the roll anymore of what they used to need a dive bomber to do the roll of. What they needed was a strike aircraft, and they had the Grumman Avenger, they had the Fairy Firefly, they had all sorts of aircraft, they didn't need the Hellcat. And that's it. People start going, oh, it's because the Hellcat was bad, or the Hellcat was this, the Hellcat was that. No, it wasn't. It's quite simple. They didn't need it. They weren't going to buy something they didn't need. Um... Team look up. Should the Royal Navy have built nuclear powered carriers during the Cold War? Slightly small in the US first USN ones with a ring of flight deck. I'd have loved to have seen them do so, and I certainly think that should have been considered as part of the CVO 1 project, and was, but. The thing was, British governments repeatedly have shown a productivity for being a little bit silly. And in this case, they were very, very silly. They basically went, no, that could cost us money. And yes, it could cost them money, but it would have been a very sensible use of their money, and very sensible use of the public money. To do so. Um, they didn't. We have to live with the consequences now. That's it, basically. They didn't do that. We live with the consequences. It's kind of like... Um, what was the company? Years ago. And I'm not going to name names. There was a mine warfare company, which I was looking at. They were developing little sort of systems for mine warfare. Uncrewed systems. And they had some shares which are available through a system. And theoretically, I could have procured some shares through that system. I was sort of eligible as I'd worked advising them, etc. I decided it wasn't... I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it because a, it was money I didn't have available at the time, really, and b, I didn't um, feel that it was necessarily legitimate of me to do so, if that makes sense. Because I didn't think, well, I'm not that involved in them. I I I I, I have a lot of respect for them and, and sort of help them out, but I feel this is a stretch to say I'm involved enough to justify doing that, uh, being part of this scheme. So I didn't. Those shares would have been worth an awful lot of money now. Do I regret it? No. Do I sometimes think it might be nice to have had that money behind me? Well, I could have bought a lot of books of it. Because their systems did take off and they've done really, really well. And it was very, very tangential as well, so in the nicest way, I really didn't think I was appropriate. But yeah. And it's the same with what we're sort of to extent we're talking about. In that um it would be nice to have nuclear powered carriers. But they made the decision then based on the reality of the British situation. British situation was the government didn't want to uh, didn't want to invest in that. They were already running nuclear submarine powered submarines, and submarines were the future. Everyone knew submarines were the future. Submarines have always been the future, and so they just thought they'd save money on the carrier project. And because we've been running oil powered carriers, so you know there's nothing different in this one. The reality, of course, is different. But it would have created other issues. But CBA one is the option that it could have happened with. 
It didn't, but that's the option it could have happened with. Okay, what are we doing? What are we doing now? Man? So, um, Rags one. Let's see. What prospects change for Von Spey if he has Blue Call with him added on? Uh, nothing really. Um, he still wins the Battle of Car uh, Carnell. He still loses the Battle of the uh, Battle of the Hawk Lions. Basically, Blue Call does nothing apart from give him a headache. And give him something extra he has to support. And it means Bluka's not there at several other battles back in the um back in the North Sea, which means other things might get sunk instead of Bluka, because let's be honest. If they carried on at the Battle of Dogger Bank and they hadn't been stopped by Blucher, then who knows what damage gets done to the Germans before it all begins, before you know, before you get to the Battle of Jutland. And that can change the Battle of Jutland dramatically. Yes, it can. Um, please don't use the modern Italian Navy as standing as leader to Pearl Harbor. Yeah, that that that's fine. I would use CGI. Honestly, I, that's be the first thing I do is get the ships properly made. Um, I'd save money on actors and actresses by going for um, people who are perfectly good but were not major film actors. So I wouldn't be going for big names. Which are pro but because you see the thing you just point out is I already have the money. So if I already have the money and I don't need to have any big names, then I can afford to save money, put the money into CGI, and get some good actors and actresses who just come from other areas. And basically, I would go through the um, I would go through all the theaters etc. and find some good stage actors. Some people who are good at showing their emotions up close. Maybe Tom Hardy. There's some fun with doing that. It's really raining that, that back here. I don't know what it is we're doing with everyone else, but uh, with us here, it's raining. Quite hard. Not that one. That's a curved one. I'm looking for an angular one. And they're all black. Helpful little things, aren't they? Luckily, I have good eyesight. Where is it? Um, if the British are building new guns, new monitors before World War II, what gun club would you use? Well, they're either use 15-inch guns, which will come off their older ships, or they use 14-inch if they're using building brand new ones and using the calibers which come from which is under construction time. So that's their options. If they're going for new guns, they'll go for 14-inch. If they're going just reusing the 15-inch stock, they'll go for 15-inch. Just reusing old stock, go 15 inch. New, go 14 inch. Hmm. 
So there is one. Not down there. What is it with parts and going missing on me? Curved, curved, angular, found it. Sitting right in front of me the whole time. Um, right, so let's see. What ships do your family like best? Sure, by now they may have an opinion. Oh, good lord, they have many and varied opinions. Uh, my mum's got a soft spot for HMS Warrior, always has done. Quite disturbingly, a large soft salt for Adrian's warrior. Um, mm, that, seriously, that that ships. She has a bit of soft salt for Jackie Fisher, to be honest. She thinks he was a bit of misunderstood, and he could, uh, you know, I can see that. And she thinks that misunderstanding though is what drove him to become what he became. And I'm going, eh, I'm not so sure about that, mum. So you know, you 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 get on with you. I'm not gonna argue. I like my limbs being attached. Um, but, yeah, my sister, not really. My sister, yeah, naval warfare really does skip her by. Um... So anyway, what do you think about all those Baltimore Bridge conspiracy theories? I tell them to go talk, uh, watch Sal on what is going with shipping. And um, if that doesn't work, then I tell them to go and have a conversation with a decent engineer. And you'll find out that you don't need to actually have... The, the, the people looking for things are people who honestly don't... Uh, looking for different theories are people who don't seem to realize the sheer power of the forces you're dealing with. And the sheer power that is that is that ship moving and uh, the amount of force it represents is just I can understand why because people it's beyond so it's so beyond your, the most people's uh, most people's experience let's be honest how uh, you know how much do people have to do with ships these days not much the concept of something which displaces over a hundred thousand tons moving That's beyond their, uh, beyond their, you know, their ken, really. You know, 100,000 tons. How much does that weigh? Well, think about it in terms of elephants, in terms of buses, in terms of trucks. Your average truck weighs in what? About five tons? Please dis debate or disagree with me. I'm tr trying to remember off the top of my head the average... The average Hilux, etc., weighs in roughly about five tons. Anyone agree, disagree? And, um. Pretty much, if you're talking about something which is 100,000 tons, you're talking about 20,000 of those tracks, uh, trucks if they're about five tons. 20. People, that that's a, the sheer quantity of that, the sheer number. It's it's so enormous, it's mind-boggling, which is why people don't get it. And then they look at the bridge design and they go, well, you must no, it, it didn't need to. It honestly didn't need to. It's the design of the bridge coupled with the force involved. The bridge was a design in a period when that wasn't even a possibility, and it wasn't, let's be, let's be honest, it hadn't gone through the best retrofits in the years. So if you want to look for conspiracy theories, just look at the people and look at the funding they put into infrastructure. And that's your conspiracy theory. Nothing nothing fancy needed with, with explosives or charges or anything like that. No, you just need to have people not investing in infrastructure. And it used to be the thing various pe nations and various people were good at. They invested in infrastructure. And that was how they got to be where they are. And the first thing they've done since they got to the place they are is stop investing in infrastructure because it's not sexy. 
and because they're huge expensive projects and you don't really know how beneficial it's going to be till after it's done. You know, we, we, we were talking about HS2 recently and that was of course cancelled in the UK and I think that was absolutely stupid. The reason is because honestly we need more capacity on the rail network if we want it to be viable for the things we want it to do. We need more capacity. That is something we all know. And when I say we all know, I mean it will, it's been explained in many, many studies and many, many pieces of work and, and politicals and politicians agree with it. But the trouble is no one wants to pay and sign up to actually pay the money required to do it. And everyone thinks it should be built elsewhere because they don't want it to upset their constituents and all these things. And you sit there and go, well, this is why you stop being a great country. This is why you end up finding yourself in it with issues because... You've stopped thinking, hang on, not the, you, you stop thinking about the benefit of things, and you're only concentrating on the ish, the complexities of it. And yes, you do need to concentrate on some complexities. You, do need, you don't want to go in completely blind, but... <sighs> Investment like that takes years to pay off it really does but once it's made as long as it's sustained it's with you for rest of the time it's benefiting your economy for the rest of the time and that's the thing when you're trying to justify it over a 10-year income, it won't be. Because it's not a 10-year income project. It's not a 20-year a 20 income project. It's a 50-year, 100-year income project. And that's what you need to be thinking about it over. Not all these short-term things. Which, sadly, is what we do think about it over. We think about it over very short-term thinking. Rent. Um, so anyway, uh, Danny Wright, if German battle cruisers are not suitable for overseas deployment, uh, what do Germans build to replace the armored cruisers? Would big six-inch cruisers be enough? Well, they probably try to do this, uh, do it with the crew with the battle cruisers. They would probably try. And honestly, then they've got a problem. Um, the reason they haven't been building cruisers, and this is the point I made in the Fleets of Jutland video, is the Germans have basically hamstrung the rest of their fleet in order to get enough ships which are dreadnought configuration completed. And that's it. Uh, this is why they've got such small destroyers at the Battle of Jutland, and this is why the rest of their fleet is the shape it is. Because of that. Because... They honestly aren't able to do anything different than what they're doing. They're not. They don't have. They don't have enough resources to be able to do more than what they're doing. That's their their, their problem. Ultimately, they only have so many resources, and they cannot do more than they're doing. They only have so much inf uh, so much money, so much infrastructure they can uh, they they have available. They wish they had more. They don't have more. This is starting to look pretty darn good, I think. Even if I do say so myself. That's the wrong way. We need one the other way. Out there. Um. 
Sir Donaldson, if the rumors around the Cable of the warships along with tech advancements, would we, uh, could be, uh, get, uh, could we get more information on the cold warships they being released sooner rather than later? Doubtful. And the reason it's doubtful is because a lot of those ships are still in service with key allies. And let's be honest, if you look around, a lot of the fleets of, uh, some of our key allies for NATO nations, etc., our main are composed of ships which used to be in our fleets. We can't release that information now, I'll discuss that, because those ships are in their fleet and are a critical component of their fleet. And if we start discussing it, we will undermine their security, because whilst, yes, their ships will have been modernised and upgraded to an extent... They're still functioning on that baseline. And therefore, you are going to be revealing key information about them. That's not exactly fair. You've sold it to them. The least you can do is help them keep it quiet for uh, while they're using it. Once it's no longer in service with them, then maybe. Uh, well, probably, certainly. But, you know. Until that point, no, you're... Uh, you're not getting it. I ain't getting that. Um. Honestly, which animals would you like to see bundle ship playing battleship against each other? Well, honestly, anyone versus king is going to be funny because of king's anger and because of the way battleship works. Um, but um, I think Collingwood versus Ca uh, Cunningham would be quite an interesting match. Those two are both quite dedicated, in, in to an extent, introverted thinkers um, who are very, very. Uh, quietly professional and I just have a feeling they would be a really interesting mix to have having that sort of scenario I could just imagine the conversation be really quite intriguing if that makes sense I missed it. How do we get on topic of drugs? Um, someone asked it about them earlier in the chat, in the questions. Scroll up and you'll find out. Um, uh, Multi range. Of all the land based aircraft that were navalized uh, for carry use, which do you consider to be the, most, uh, the best conversion and which was the worst? Best conversion. Well, the Sea Hornet is a variation on the Hornet, which was a variation, evolution on Mosquito to an extent. So that was pretty darn good. Uh, but honestly, Gladiator was probably the best for its time um, of the conversions. And worst, Seafire. And not because of its operational capability, just literally because the aircraft was ripping itself apart. Okay, I, I I can understand some people going, but 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 yes, and I I do agree with the but 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 it's a, it's still a cool aircraft, but <laughs> the fact is it's it's literally ripping itself apart with every takeoff and landing, it's um, it's the definition of what you do not want on a carrier, something which is literally ripping itself apart at every opportunity uh, every time you use it. There is there is a problem in that scenario, and it, it's it's not necessarily it's not me being critical of the aircraft. Before someone starts going, you're being anti-British again. I do love the way some people accuse. So I don't know, some people accuse me of being a Tebo, and some people accuse me of being I don't know anti-British. And I sit there and go, 
make your minds up, A, because one person was actually did both. Uh, the different comments were about two, a week apart. One comment accused me of being a T-boo. Next comment accused me of being anti-British to win it next week. And I was sort of going, I can either be one or the other. I'm not, but okay, I'm not going to be both. Otherwise, that's just me being, that's a level of internal disagreement, which frankly wouldn't work well with my brain. Um, I have enough trouble with my brain as it is without, you know, adding that level of discontinuity going on there. And, you know, secondly, no. It's just a, too much effort to be that. Just go with the evidence. It's far easier. Uh, but the thing is, yeah, the sea fire is just no. <laughs> you don't want an aircraft which is ripping itself apart. You really don't. Um, Tell me, Renaval Mustang, weren't you some dedicated air cooled I radio engines? They were, but there were other navies which weren't and were interested in the concept from the get go. It never took place because, well, other things were available, and frankly, the, the U.S. Army Air Corps was very, very proud of what they had and didn't want anyone else nicking it. But, um, yeah, it would have been fun. It would have been fun. These are cool. And it's a little bit it's cool. Look. It's a, generally, it's a cool build. I have to say, I do like this Mercedes build. If you do see them, I picked it up for, I think it was £15 in Asda in the UK. So, you know, it was on, I think it was on deal. It was on special. Uh, but, um, yeah, if you if you do see it, it's worth it. It's a nice build. It's perfectly fun to do. And I'm able to do it while distracted by chat. So, honestly, everyone should be able to do it. So that goes on to that. This is going to be interesting because this is sort of like a pipe cleaner thing. And basically you start it off here and you curl it round there. And that I presume is the protection for if they roll, the roll protection. I haven't seen, watched actually watch Formula One in so long; it's disturbing. And it goes down. Oh, so it goes down like that. Oh, that's that's even cooler. I'm not sure if you can see that properly in this side. I think I'm going to hide it there. Yeah, that's cool. That's actually that's a cool idea. Um, then that's a six, and I need a four. I need a four to go four. I need another four. That's a four. That's good. And then I need a five. Five alive. Okay. Um, next for an idea for a war game. Use a nuclear submarine docked to a carrier as an azopod propulsion. If you already have the submarine and want a nuclear carrier, it seems like an easy fix to me. Uh, oh. There are so many issues with that. There really are issues with that. I can see where you're coming from, but that 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 would rip a path and rip your hull off. We would rip the whole of the hull off the carrier and the 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 tower and or hull or whatever it's connected off the off the submarine currents and surface and the way that that the carrier will move with the surface of the water at the the sea, whereas the submarine doesn't. And oh, it's just. Yeah, that that's just although it is affected that height. Yeah, it, it's it's just not a good scenario. It's really not a good scenario. I cannot overstate how bad a scenario that would become. Very quickly. Okay, so that goes to there, and that goes to there. So obviously, I'm building this front wing from scratch. The aft wing came pre-assembled, but the front wing I'm building from scratch. I wonder why I don't make that decision. I don't mind. I'm just gonna. Doesn't make sense necessarily. Start off with the, with this as the thing I build from. <laughs> I said build the 
the f earlier piece from scratch because that was the thing I built first. No, oh, that's why I've got to build it from scratch because it's going to be complicated colours. Sucre. That's why it's complicated because they want me to do complicated colours. They want me to do an actual colour scheme. But I don't know. Okay, so I want um, not that one that one. So it's going to be, uh, on this one, it's going to be, hang on, let's check that, that PWC, go, IWC going backwards. So if it's this way up, Now he's going that way. IWC. And um, they they actually have some things on here which will only be spotted if it goes upside down. Oh no, 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 it actually makes sense that's on the top side now. I was gonna say that's a bit crawl. We we'll take your money for advertising, but we're going to stick it so that it only shows when you this when this thing goes upside down. Yeah, that would be a bit cruel. Funny, but cruel. Um, my question: What if Small Display had been recorded to January before one? You could have, if they had basically the moment war looked like it started, had recalled him and his fleet to um, Germany. It could have made it before the war began. They could, they could have actually raced because the British wouldn't have stopped them. That's the thing. For the British, it if they get home, that's advantageous. So if they want to go through the Suez Canal, they go through the Suez Canal. In which case, they could have ra they could have raced home and maybe made it before war began. If they started when things started mucking around, but you know. They wouldn't have had much time, and it would have to be a very quick decision. As we know, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm was not very good at quick decisions. Let's be honest, he wasn't very good at a lot of things. The man was a walking menace to himself, let alone his country. And the fact he managed to actually get through the morning is a surprise to me on some occasions. Oh, have you not managed to kill yourself already? That is a surprise. You're still breathing without assistance from anyone. Oh, good lord, I am shocked. Hang on, hang on, hang on. It might be conjugating a thought. Is it going to conjugate a thought? Oh, it is. Is it an actual sensible thought? No, it's Kaiser Wilhelm. He wouldn't have one of those if it caught, if it ran up and whacked him on the head. Um. Would it have been better for Von Spain and his squadron to have been in Germany at the start of World War I? Men's Morrison. Yes, it would have been. For starters, there were some really well-trained crews who were really kind of useful, not a big lot, and loss on that, on that scale. Uh, Von Spey himself would have been quite useful to have back. And honestly, they weren't doing much good where they were. And when I say much good, I mean any good. And they weren't doing any good for them where they were.
So this is going to take a lot of decals. Hey, Dan. Books can have a nice day, say, in my house, Alex, and unlikely you know, lost an armed convoy. Look, don't take this the wrong way, but you've got a wide variety of convoys to pick from. There's a wide variety of convoys to pick from, and that's not really reassuring. Um... Which no, the stuff, Which navy's rebuild program is more ambitious, in your opinion, to the uh, the current USN or Royal Navy? Uh, Professor Sal's video on recently left the USN not in the best light. I wonder what Royal Navy's like. Uh, the Royal Navy's is even worse, as say the Royal Navy's graphics regularly show you. Um, we have either, we did, uh, we have governments which basically jump from the insane to the ridiculous when it comes to their statements on defense. Um, I always remember the scene from the West Wing where, uh, I think it was McGarry, uh, right, uh, Joseph McGarry, uh, the um, guy who's basically the inveterate polit politician, shouts, are we going to be the best defense adjusted for the inflation of the Vis since the Visigoths? You know, what are we going to be? And that's that's really the sensible thing to think is, you know, what are we what are we doing here? When we claim we're going to be so securely defended, who are we comparing ourselves to if we're doing that? And are you really providing that much money? Because I think the Vizicos might have topped you because, well, they kind of had to. They kind of didn't have a choice in the matter. They they basically spent the on defense or they died. Nastily. And the hands of lots of people trying to take them out. Um... You're in charge of producing a 1930 set of Yes Minister called Yes Admiral. What scenes would you create? Uh, that would be long and complicated to discuss, but the first scene and the most important scene I'm going to create is Admiral Henderson honestly telling people that he's honestly not building an aircraft carrier. And basically it would be all set around the third Sea Lord and what he was getting through built. And what he was actually telling the minister when the minister managed to track him down. It would be a case of, the minister, oh, you've you found me. That's, that's, what happened? How did that happen? I have questions for you, Admiral. Do you? That's interesting, minister. Just give me, no, 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 you're not ducking out of here again. Wasn't ducking out of here, minister. Would never duck out on you. Was just going to inspect something. I just need to check one setting. Why are you climbing in that aircraft to check that setting? Just need to check this one thing. One thing. And just one, one, one thing. Just checking it. Just checking it. Um, Admiral, why are you taking off? Why, what, the, Admiral? Sorry, Minister, I can't hear you. We'll take that as agreement with our plans as discussed earlier, previously. What plans? What did we discuss previously? We have one, two, three. Oh, and I think we stick our where is our who drives from the Claren these days? I can't remember. Um, is it McLaren? It's McLaren, isn't it? Yeah. Mercedes McLaren. Oh, well, no. Who drives from Mercedes these days? There we go. There and there. <sighs> There we go. 
We have Mercedes. I don't think that's a bad one. And that brings my Formula One collection to exactly... I'm sure there was another Formula One car going around here a short while ago. Ford GT's gone. I know that's in the box. Um, what was that one? Was that Formula One? I don't think that is Formula One. Racing Porsche Le, Le Mans. That's Le Mans. I'm sure I had another Formula One car around here. Oh ah, well. Alright. Oi, caramba. Come back here. Hello. Oh. Hilux weighs about one and a half tons. Okay, then I was grossly overestimating that one's weight. And basically, for 100,000 tons, you would be talking about... One half uh, sixty thousand. Sixty thousand of them would get you to ninety thousand. Um, sixty six thousand would get you to ninety nine thousand. Uh, sixty six thousand six hundred and sixty six would get you pretty much most of the way there. So yeah, that's how many Hiluxes you would be having to deal with. Thank you, Manly. What, uh, what, what truck was I thinking of that was five tons? I'm sure there was a truck going around my head that was five tons. I may have watched too much of Heavy D Sparks. I might be thinking of far bigger trucks than the Hilux. Anyway, um... Save that for next week because I have a feeling I'll be doing more of this next week. Uh, well, at least we still be packing. Uh, uh, well, I will still be packing or something. Um. Do, 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 do. Scooters, which museum ships have you not visited that you're most looking forward to seeing the person in the future? Uh, there's all the Swedish ones. Um, I keep dropping hints about that. But no, uh, the there is several when it comes to um, Japan, etc. and America. I, I'd love to visit all the carriers in America. That is that is one of the things on my list to do. It really is on my list to do it. Um but it's actually getting to go do it. Sounds strange. But it is it is getting to go do it. It's getting to be able to go and actually see those ships. I'd love to do that. But Yeah, it's 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 funding and it's it's sorting everything out with my family and it's 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 far easier for me to go away once they are more secure in location uh, in terms of there is family and things around to support them. Far easier then. Uh, it's one of the things I've noticed with the big trips we've done recent years. It's, it's been a bit of a worry because there's n <sighs> the only people really left in this area to support them are my aunt and uncle and good love them. They are. They, they they try their best, but everyone younger is down in the southwest. And the thing is, my aunt is my mum's twin sister. My uncle is a little bit younger, but not much younger, and that's not really much of support. So yeah, it's it's easier if they're but if they are actually down there. So yeah, it'll be fun. Um, Mikasa is high is high up the list. But the American carriers, especially, are things I want to go see. Because I've been past them, but never been in them. And I'd love to actually go in them and wander around. You know, for... It 
if I was going to be honest, I would say that, um, well, my probably my version of seeing Iowa my version of being able to go see Iowa is going to see the older carriers of the American Navy it, it, for me if if I could go see USS Hornet and some of the older Essex class carriers that still survived. That's just that's something that's always been on my list. And um, yeah, because I am an that was my PhD, that was my bachelor's, that was what I do a lot is naval aviation and development of aviation aircraft carriers, and the British ones don't survive. So I can't go see uh, see the British ones, but you know, I'm happy to see the uh, the Amer the American ones and have a look around them. There are no there are no Japanese ones I can go see. That's the shame, really. All those ones I studied about. It's kind of like... It's like the tribal class. The... Seeing Haida. And actually being able to get close and walk on and It's just the case of... Those things had lived in my head for so long. Those ships. Actually getting to see one in person. That was... And wander around it. That was... Big. And... Yeah. The American carriers... I've seen them in a distance. I've never managed to get close to them. They've got so much in them. They've got so much there, which are keys to understanding some of the ideas and thinking in the 1920s. And yes, it's from the American perspective. But that doesn't make it wrong. It doesn't make it right. It makes it from the American perspective. And that can teach you a lot about the British and the Japanese perspective. Because we can't see those examples. So we can at least see what, how one side was thinking, and then we can look at, well, what's their differences? What's their similarities? How are they approaching your situation? And that can give you a good starting point, a basis. Uh, the problem I often have with a lot of the aviation discussing, naval aviation discussing, is people going, presuming one side got it right and one side got it wrong. And the question is not that, it's who got it right for them. And I would argue, in World War II, all sides things haven't got it right for them, but they made mistakes. The Japanese mistake was actually far more to do with pilots than it was to do with aircraft. Uh, it was far more to do with pilots than it was to do with aircraft. Aircraft, yeah, they didn't, they weren't designed for a long war against an air pier threat, but they hadn't, they never thought they'd going to have that because they didn't think they could survive that scenario, and that makes sense then when you think about that. But they needed more a better pilot system. They needed a better pilot training system, definitely. They really did. So. Aaron, what would, do you think is the latest start date that the RN and USN could meet to refit their battleships with 15 to 16-inch guns, respectively? Um, so refit the 14s to 16s and the 15s to... the 14s to 15s. Nineteen thirty-seven would better fit by about both. Um, seven. If you were allowed a point of design commission, you worship. What would your HMS Clark to be in both World War Two and Monday? 
In World War II, it would be a 9.2 inch gunned heavy cruiser. Everything else is pretty much being designed. That's the only thing which is made out of it. And today, uh, it would be mine and Drax designed for the Type 83 and be magically being built. Um, excuse me, what are your thoughts on the third SpaceX test of the Super Heavy Starship launch system a couple weeks ago? I haven't actually watched it yet, so I'll reserve judgment till I've actually had time to watch it. At some point, my insomnia is going to allow me to actually catch up on this watching this stuff, rather than continue on packing up boxes of books, and boxes of other things, and boxes of all sorts of things, and keep packing boxes and boxes and boxes. And hopefully we sign documents on Tuesday, because otherwise we'll have done all this packing and we won't be able to actually move. So Clark, future museum ships, with the UK seemingly getting a Type 21 back from Pakistan and maybe getting a Black Swan class from Egypt, how much work will be needed before we can visit them? Um, a fair large chunk if anyone's prepared to provide the money. If we do get the money, though, they could be done as well. They could be good, pretty cool. Uh, Frank Spider, what is your favourite colour scheme for a plane, tank, and submarine? Submarine? It's got to be grey. It's just grey is good one. Oh, good for submarines. Uh, tank? I liked the 1942 North African campaign. The, uh, the, the, um, I think my Matilda, I've got a Matilda painted in the colour scheme. Uh, from the Desert Rats sort of scenario. I've got a Matilda too, I think, painted in the colour scheme. Um, and as for plain... There was some actually full Mars, I think, painted pink, which I found a quite cool one. The Mount Baden pink, but that was mainly because it like it winds people up. But uh, yeah, honestly, the, 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 mm. yeah, I like this. I think the swordfish color scheme is always pretty good. But you know, the the color schemes basically change so quickly. It's you have to pinpoint the time quite strictly to say I want that color scheme. Um, as nice one. As the British were one or two battleship construction generations away from Yamato size with Yamato capability, what size range do you see the Iron hitting before calling time on battleship construction? Oh, I think they would get to the seventy-five, would try out something bigger, and then go back to the seventy-five, and then they keep churning out variations on roughly the seventy-five thousand ton. I think that's what the British would roughly do. So I, I think they'd get the 75, probably try 95,000 ton and go, mm, don't need anything more than this. We really don't. Nice um, second. Would it be accurate to say that for the Royal Navy's monitors need sea supremacy to operate effectively? Yes, that's always the case for monitors. That's what they do, because monitors are there to support the ground off forces. They're not there to fight the sea battles. McDermott, are you trying to wind me up? Nuclear carrier submarines? No. Next, you'll be suggesting the actual carrier design from the Marvel movies. The, 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 the shield car heli carrier is actually a sensible design. With those great big rotor blades, which are designed to kill their pilots every time they try and take off or land. Look, here is the thing. If you're going to have massive rotors... On the four quadrants of the ship. Do not have an angled flight deck. You'll kill your pilots. Because they'll be taking off. Of landing. Straight into rotors. Which are designed. To suck air through. To give it thrust. To keep it up. And that's probably going to overwhelm. Your aircraft coming in or taking off. Which means. Your aircraft's going to become fod. Straight through your engine. So, the bright sparks who keep designing the heli carriers with angled flight decks. Thank you for showing me you pay no attention to the realities of operating them and actually do not think about it.
Um, nineteen eighty three. Oh, Baron Swan. Let's see. What makes a Rolls Royce so special? What car engines do you like to work on? Um. Okay, so I've had a Vauxhall engine which I worked on on my own car, and my own cars I've had older Volvos and older Subarus, which I can tend to rip apart and make work. Although I do sometimes when the more Subarus have had to actually actually hook them up to something. Um. But usually the the ones I've done the most work on myself are Subarus because Volvos don't tend to need any work and the Subarus you can play around with and get more out of them whereas the Volvos are specifically designed to stop you playing around and, more, and getting more out of them I think. But the Volvos are quite easy to maintain. I did once keep a... Um, a, 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 a I scared the living daylights out of my summer students. Okay. So... I knew on the back of my Vox, or my old Vauxhall, this was, it had a foam bit which held up the exhaust at the back. And it was really annoying. It would break going over speed bumps sometimes. Even if you're doing the speed limit, it was just, the way, because it was foam and it, was desi it wasn't designed in a period when there were speed bumps and just, it would just wear out. Every four or five months I'd go for a new one. And it didn't involve me much because it cost about three quid. So it wasn't something I was really going to bother about. Every four or five months I'd buy, I'd have to spend three quid. Actually, what I did was I bought a pack of ten of them. Uh, every time I went, sort of, I got down to the last one of the pack of ten, I buy another pack of ten, which is why I have eight still, which I just chucked out the other day because I don't think I'm going to need them anymore. Um, but they cost me thirty quid for a pack of ten. That's, that's fine. And it broke. I didn't have a spare one in the car, and so my students came out. Uh, came out, and they come up from another lecture. And it was, I'd come up to my car from my early lecture, found this, and I'd gone down to the store, bought some wire, uh, some cable, and they came out of their lecture, and they found me underneath my car, tying up my exhaust with garden cable, which would get me home fine. <laughs> and I'm just going, why are you doing that, Doug? See, it'll get, yeah, it'll get it home, it'll get it home fine, I'll drive it safely. It did. It's perfectly fine and safe. It, it was the really annoying thing, because it was held on in every other place by metal bits, and then at the end, the last bit on the end, was a foam bit. And it was literally a metal... It was a metal hook on the exhaust, which hooked into this piece of foam, which you literally... which you slotted in. So, um... It all, came, it all sort of slotted in, up together, and then you'd put a single screw through the foam, that sort of thing. And it, that was how you held it in underneath, and it was just... Yeah, it was great fun. It was great fun. I used to like taking that engine apart. That was, that was my first car, and it was a 1.4 litre estate, which means it had... 97 brake horsepower when brand new, and it was an L reg, so by the time I had it, it did not have 97 brake horsepower. But the thing was, it was so cheap to insure. And for a bachelor student, university, that would, that car worked like me. And it was big enough to take the dogs everywhere, because it was an estate. So I could fit everyone in, go wandering around. Got pulled over at one point by the police because I was driving so slowly through um, Box Hill. And I pointed out the reason I was driving slowly was because they were behind me. And I'd indicated I was going to pull into the side, but they hadn't given me space to do so. I was driving to the car park. The reason I was driving to the car park, both uh, the dog was loose in the back seat. And I had my mum was sitting next to me in the front seat. And I went, are you going to drive fast in that situation? And the policeman made me go through all the sobriety tests, and then they, after I did this, I said, no, I wouldn't have been driving fast in that situation, sir, carry on. Uh, and I went, can I, as you've stopped me, can I tie the dog in properly now? Because he seems to have managed to open the seatbelt. And I went, yeah. And they actually gave me a cool thing, which was a clip which would go over your seatbelt to cover it and stop the um, dog management. They just had some on them, and they gave me them. That was useful. Uh, see, I'm good. What about nuclear carrier submarines? No, not getting into that. Nice to go from about the treaty. How likely is it the U.S. and New Jersey would be on the post-1920 South Dakota and Lexington successor? Uh, something like that would certainly have been on there. Um, Nine six eight three one. If the Edinburgh subclass was big enough to take five triple six-inch guns, 
Where did the iron put the fifth turret? I already answered that one. Forward or the uh, forward? It'd be A, B, and C turrets forward with A and B on the same level and C foot raised or super firing. Uh, Van Home, I have read that sailors in merchant fleets during the age of sail often took their own small goods with them to sell for extra income. My question is, did the Navy do something similar? Yes. Um, captains on ships, etc., would often do that. Ramon, okay, to keep it on, I got on a car, I trust Warspite in place of South Dakota. As a borrower to Australia, same versus Kirishima. Uh, sheesh. That's not nice. Uh, Warspite's already done that kind of operation at the Battle of Matapan. Um, you just have to look. Look at what Warspite did at Matapan. Imagine that taking place in Guadalcanal. That's the sort of that's the sort of operation which Warspite likes to do. Blackmaster, what are you looking forward to when Shipshape visits Macassar on the Japan trip? A lot of interesting naval history and probably counting rivets and welds. Um... My signal, did you get an invite to go aboard New Jersey for a move to dry dock? Nope. But honestly, I'm A, not famous enough, and B, probably, if they, uh, considering they probably, if they would have asked anyone about me, they'd have probably asked Drac, and Drac would have probably pointed out that the moment I'm in the middle of a move, and I am brassic. So the answer would have been, even if they had asked me, probably would have been no, because I have neither the time nor the money to go as much as I'd like to. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't invited, but I think probably if, the, A, I'm not important enough to be invited, and B, they'd have probably, if they hadn't talked to Drac about inviting me, he'd have probably said, he's not in a state to come at the moment. I've got an entire house to move. <coughs> this is not the time to go away. Let's see, from question 28. What would the Royal Navy have intended to replace its fleet of M29, M15 class? Uh, it wouldn't have wanted to replace them. Honestly, they were World War I builds. They were built for World War I. The moment World War I was over, they got rid of them, and they were thinking about what they might need next. But the thing is, they didn't really need anything at that point. Uh, they would probably have built whatever, whatever they would have built. They would have built something rush in wartime. They built those as wartime builds. They built the rest of wartime builds. That's the thing. They're, to an extent, relying on their infrastructure and industry. That's what they do. Blammer Maximus, if most of the German fleet had to be had been destroyed at Jutland and the British break into the Baltic after repairs, do you think that they would attempt naval annex? Yeah, they would attempt something. Um, they would certainly attempt something. What they attempt... That's an interesting discussion, but they would attempt something. I don't think they really need to attempt more than make do more than attempt landings. The reason I say I don't think they need to do more than just attempt landings is because if you consider the starvation and issues being caused in Germany by the restrictions as well as the blockade as well as if you can bring the blockade to the Baltic coast of Germany their economy drops like anything. It just, it just, the sheer amount of starvation you'd be dealing with is, yeah. There were, there are figures that there are as many as one and a half million people starving and already half a million starved to death by end of 1917, something like that, for, due to the effect, impacts and the uh, wider effects of the blockade. The, the, the blockade carrying on longer was going to be worse for them. Blockade is a blunt instrument, but it's a very nastily effective one. Um, like most of, what if preserved, Victoria's been preserved? Where is she docked? Probably Portsmouth. I, you see, the thing is, I know there are lots of people who would put stuff, and it would be nice to see it in London. It would be nice to see it in London. But there's only so much space on the Thames. There really is only so much space on the Thames. And so I think 
I think basically Belfast is a good fit for that spot on Thames. You're just right part of the right side of naval looking and not so big she's changing the skyline sort of thing. I think if Victorious had been turned into a museum ship rather than they'd spent all that money trying to rebuild her, um, I think she could have been a beautiful ship sitting in probably Portsmouth. I say, well, do you t do people take for granted that the hours are still running through ships? Yes. Honestly, having a whole class preserved like that is such. There is no other scenario where that's happened. There is no other scenario. It's fantastic. It's absolutely amazing. And yeah. Um, it's Morrison. Top five ships do you wish preserve were preserved? Nagato, Warspite, Illustrious, Saratoga. And I was trying not to be very personal, but I'm going to go with Nubian. I'd like a British tribal class destroyed to be preserved. Why Nagata? Because it's the last line of the Japanese great battleships. And it shows you their development period. And it's so much of the high point in many ways of Japan. This is That's the funny thing to think about. And there are people who are, would, might disagree with me. But, you know, Leslie has, was in the chat earlier. And might well elaborate on this. But honestly... Japan reaches a high point of their development, of their safety, etc., in the 1920s, and then afterwards it goes down, and it goes downhill quite fast and quite nastily. And really, in the Gatos, their expression of this, their expression of Japan finding itself and it coming out of World War One, what it ha what it was, and what it hoped to became and become. And I'd like to see that. Um, many things important. Going to see the IJ and the fleet carriers is possible. Think is the thing is logistically, it is a bit more complicated than arranging a visit to say Yorktown. Yeah, it's a lot more complicated. But most of with all the changes in tech, metallurgy, and boiler engine tech. If the KGVs have been designed with an F3 design, no 14-inch gun requirement, what changes in design would happen? Um, if the King of the have been designed with an F3 design, so 15-inch 50s, uh, latest metallurgy of gun design, and what changes would happen? No 14-inch gun requirement. Um, they'd been... Ooh, honestly, with an F3 design and doing that, the boilers, you would be talking about a 30, 30, a 30 knot ship, definitely. 30, possibly 32 knot ship. You'd be talking about nine 15 inch guns. And yeah. Probably same thickness of armor as the King George V's. 
but that would be a scary ship for anyone to come across, and actually possibly slightly quicker and easier to build. And because it's a triple turret rather than a quadruple turret, a lot easier to implement and get into service. Well, more complicated than visit the CV-10 USS uh, Yeah, the, 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 the CV-5 USS Lockdown would be slightly more difficult. I, I did do realise that, Melanie. I did kind of guess which one you're talking about. Um, now, would it be accurate to reason that the Brooklyn class uh, 5 triple six inch guns and the town class can't is, can, is due to the size of the turrets? Uh, no. It's also the size of the internal arrangements of the hull. And what exactly one wanted, one nation wanted from theirs versus the other nation wanted from theirs. Uh, as I think Drac was explaining quite well on one of his dry docks today. I cannot remember which one. I what I, I have listened to both though. Um, I think it was in what show one he was talking about trail protection. You can really see from looking cruisers what they're supposed to do. The British cruisers are designed to be a lot more of an independent actor. And going out solo and doing a lot of more solo missions. That's a far bigger priority within their design fit than American cruisers. And that affects things you have to have in the hull and certain spaces for supplies and workshops and those things. And whilst the Americans do have them as well, the Americans can afford to use slightly less space for them and slightly more space for guns. And the British have to use more space for them and less space for guns. Um, nice to get everyone. I answered the New Jersey question, definitely. And I did answer the question 27 as well, definitely. So, go back through the video, you will find they have been answered. Why would the British consider reducing K3's main battery from 18 to 16 inch guns? Uh, the British wouldn't reduce it to a 16 inch, it would be reduced to 16 and a half inch. And the British would do it if they wanted to have more, uh, more firepower for speed or armour, but honestly, no. It's in it, the nice way. It depends. Are they trying to produce the K3 in a post World War Two, uh, in a late World War Two configuration? Because then the British were working on a 16-inch gun. That's accurate. But if it's a post World War One configuration, the British aren't working on a 16-inch gun until after the London and Washington Treaty. Before that, they're working on a 16 and a half inch gun. Uh, it's developed from 15-inch gun. Well, nine six eight everyone. Then that, that's different from your phraseology. I didn't miss them. You just weren't there for them. If you write you, if you said you missed the answer to these questions, could I do them again? That's a different phraseology than saying I missed them. Let's put that. It's a joy. I have, I have the questions. And I have live chat as well. Um, Well, it's not really cheaper for the British. The British, a nice way, the 16 and a half inch gun is what they're working on. Um, the reason they don't, the, the, they don't need to worry about costs of the ships of that sort. Well, just have to look at the sheer amount of infrastructure British have. 
Ron really since they have the issues they do and the costs they do later in in their build up to World War Two is because they've let the they've they've actually been paying for the infrastructure to close and then they're having to pay for the infrastructure to reopen. That makes things more expensive. Believe it or not, you don't have that problem at the end of World War One. The British have a oodles of infrastructure. Oodles and oodles of it. Oodles and oodles of it. And that's the problem. You know, it, it's, the, it's the classic thing of people going, it's so expensive at this point. Well, it's expensive because you're having to reopen infrastructure, which you shut down. So it would be expensive 20 years earlier. No, the infrastructure was working, fully crewed and manned and, uh, and uh, fine at that time. So it wouldn't have been expensive. No, it would have been cheaper. <laughs> it would have been a lot cheaper. Ah, <laughs> oh, good lord. Ah, oh, man. As you were called away. Okay, nice. Room. Let's answer the questions. Um, the Lexington successor, yes. Of course, New Jersey's going to go. They do it in state order. And I put forward it would be an ABC configuration receiving a super firing turret. Um, see how I'm doing. Hey, at least you're not my sister. She took a temper tantrum and refused to let me fix her exhaust. So a coat hanger held it together for two months. And then it had no exhaust until it needed the inspector. <laughs> It'd be great to watch you do an engine build a series on the channel. Could be considered a write-off as it would pay, uh, be a spare replacement mill for your current car. Oh. My current car is a Volvo V40, which I love dearly. But honestly, that engine is, tight, is tighter than a... Mm. Um, when we're down in Cornwall, once we're sorted out, I might help out when my cousins were there shop. At uh, some points, in which case I will do some. I will put some of the builds work I do helping out them. I would never consider myself a trained mechanic, but I have helped them out over the years, and I've done a lot of work on my own engines. But I usually get it checked by one of the family members who is a mechanic to check I've done the right thing. Um, check I haven't mucked it up because it's it's better to be safe than sorry when you're traveling, even when you're taking little cousins etc. around in the car. One of the first things I always try and teach people, the first thing you can sacrifice in life is ego. It's the easiest way to get correct information. <laughs> now that will be fun, Stafford. Why counting wells and rivets? Because they can teach you a lot by what, where the rivets are and what they're doing with them. Are they riveting to the same, to the full Royal Navy standard, or are they riveting to a foreign build standard? It tells you exactly how the Royal Navy is viewing the Japanese at the time. Uh, Black Moses, you become the emergency director of the UK from the end of World War II to 1960. What do you do? Infrastructure investments. Masses of infrastructure investments. Ma uh, you know, basically rebuild the infrastructure of Britain and also manage and tell architects to not build in such blooming brutalist style. I don't care whether it's efficient and concrete look is easy and we've got lots of it. I want something which looks architecturally beautiful. I don't want something which is slabs of ugly concrete. And if you're building something over two stories high in terms of blocks of flats, you better have a lift put in. And it better be a well lit system. And then we'll start on the infrastructure. We'll start on the railway, putting in the railways and sorting out all the electrification of railways. And definitely not letting Beeching's report go through. Let's reorganise things properly. Um, and for starters, is the people that me the people measuring them have to stay overnight and be dead and a full day measuring people arriving and leaving. All sorts of things. What makes a ship beautiful? What makes a ship sexy? I couldn't say, but I can certainly tell it when I see it. And I'm not going to call ugly uh, uh, cool ships ugly or strange ships. Um, the ships that I'd like to see saved, though... I'd like Le Guar to be still around. I think that'd be quite cool to have Le Guar. I'd like Le Guar to be sitting in a harbour on the other side of the channel from Warrior. 
so they can be sort of compared and contrasted. I think that'd be cool. C, that's exactly from C would be super firing. A and B would be both low. The architects could argue brutalism is beautiful, but remember I'm a dictator. If necessary, I will ca I, I will happily have them march to some place where they can have their architecture done in peace. Just not anywhere near me. It'd be a case of, you know what? You want brutalist architecture? That's great. Here is an island in the middle of the North Atlantic. Enjoy. I'm not sure what's going on with Richard. Richard, are you talking about CERN? Oh, it is CERN. Yeah, if CERN actually managed to open a portal or use that that amount of electricity, I'd be surprised. They'd probably blow it up. Yeah, Brutus buildings are just not fun. No, no. Mm. And... And pro how would I do the sort of education? I'd probably start by having. Uh, I uh, the seriously the idea of trade schools and leading into apprenticeships. Have an apprenticeship and have all the professional associations, etc. Like plumbers and all those things, work w uh, have to set up a program whereby there is literally a trade school program that people can go into at sixteen. And people can decide what they want to do. They have to do their, their school qualifications up to 16. And then they could go do a sort of trade skill. They could go do A-levels, whatever they wanted. Based on, you know, based to an extent on their grades. But also to an extent on their interests. And have that set up. I, and I'd probably get rid of national service quite early on, actually. I know I'm supposed to need it for the whole nuclear war with the, uh, the Soviets, etc. But that would be something I'd do... I, I would be more concerned about dealing with certain things at home. And the army of occupation in Germany would not be get as massive as the British army of the Rhine. Mainly because I want to have the army deployable. I don't want to have it fixed in Germany. Um, I might get a lot of pressure from the Americans over that, but I would be basically going, I have a lot of naval strength. I don't. I wouldn't get involved in sewers. Sewers is never a good idea from either get go. Uh, managed um, options on these things, but things like Gibraltar, etc., would probably get offered um, membership in the. Uh, would not. Would get offered a membership in the UK as their own sort of scenario. I might even put through my idea of a constitution for the UK and get Gibraltar as a a place in the UK and have them M for MPs, the Falklands MPs, all those things to sort of just fix problems before they become. Because the Falklands is sending an MP to the UK and is a major facility for the Royal Navy in the South Atlantic and is built up as such. And we do something similar with certain other sites around the world. You can really secure British positions. For example, again, I do that with Diego Garcia. long before the problems turn up. When being a part of Britain is considered a good thing. 
use that to my advantage. Again, dictator. Not necessarily a nice person at this point. If you've got that power, you might as well use it. Probably why I shouldn't be one. Um, that must, how quickly could the Admiral class be hiring construction if after a sturdy lead, Jutland sees near destruction of the German fleet, but also most of the battle cruisers? Um, they could have been accelerated and put into service by 1917, 1980. If they'd really want to push them through, they could have really pushed them through. But if a sturdy led Jutland, um, sees the near destruction of the German fleet, but also destruction of battle cruisers, it might well not be the Admirals which come through. Because the Admirals are sort of, ah. Uh, they might push through, but they might also change completely. And they could do that. They have the yard space. Uh, Frank's wonder, let's see. If you go to explore the hull engine guns and other space of another class, I saw the idea of Fibrick in turn. Uh, what might you most be looking into and what might you be surprised at? I'd go for the engines. There's a reason why in all the videos you see from our trips in ship shape, I'm usually the one that in the engine room. If ever you need, if ever you come across a ship, a, a ship with ship shape crew are on, and you're wondering where I am, look for the deepest, darkest part of the ship, and I'll be crawling through there quite happily. I'll be in the bowels of the ship internal. I will go as deep as I can get, and I'll be wandering along there. I will quite happily crawl into all the tight, spy, uh, uh, confined spaces, all the spaces which you're really not supposed to go. In some regards, I will go. Because I will be going there. Because to me, that's kind of that's part of forensic engineering. That's part of looking at the engineering as close as you can get and getting as close as you can to it. Which is really not good for your lungs, by the way. But I also don't tend to wear a mask because, uh, honestly, uh, down there the mask gets in the way and gets hot, and you've got all sorts of things, and it just becomes more of an annoyance. Just don't breathe that much. Um, Gibraltar's lovely. I haven't been to it in a long while, but it's lovely. A Nelson battleship was you saved. Yeah, it would have been nice to have been saved. But the thing is, if you don't save War Spite, Drac knows where I live. Look. Nice way. Drac knows where I live, and he's not that far away, so... If I don't say War Spite... He, he, he's got a lot of weapons. And he's one of my best friends. I don't want to have to fight him. So I'm going to say Warspite. <laughs> I like proving. <laughs> and I don't want to... You know, the nicest way for knowing and knowing us two and us two in the way we work and the nicest way we'd end up going... Uh, we'd, we'd be like those uh, all those soldiers in the American Civil War who <laughs> managed to kill each other at the same time. <laughs> Just really not... Not terrible for the World Navy history then. Um... Obviously, whatever happened to your interest in those strange coast castles in the, in the, across the UK? I still do that. I've got a plan of doing videos about them, and I'm going to. Once down in Cornwall, you're going to see a lot more videos about them because there's a whole load of them down in Cornwall. And you're also at some point I'm going to do a book about it. It's just what I like to do. But uh, it's <sighs> the trouble is this is going to sound terrible. Surrey is lovely for getting to places which have connections to the motorway network. It's not great for getting to places which don't. And it's such a faffle that you just sort of go, hmm. And again, it's one of the things, as I said, leaving my family, I love them dearly. But at the moment, if... I'm going to have this conversation with my aunt and uncle at some point. Um, there is... Me and my sister, and my sister can also get quite ill. 
in this area as the youngest. All the rest are down in the southwest or across the world, but they're mostly down in the southwest or they're somewhere up in the north of Scotland. And southwest makes sense. It does. So when there's more people around, that means if let's put it this way, if I'm away, then there's also about two dozen well, it's about two dozen cousins plus partners in that area who are all in my age group. So if there's a problem, there are roughly fifty people to spread it, uh, spread the uh, spread the issue over of uh, who of for the fifty people to find someone who's available if someone's away. Whereas up here, it's I've me and my sister, so. It's far easier to leave and go wandering and know you'll be okay and know you'll be able to get back and solve problems when there's a large network to support you. What if the Americans had known most of the details of Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor and attempted to trap them? How would this go? Uh, you'd want carriers strike ready to hit the carriers after their first launch. You'd want fighters airborne to intercept. You'd want the battleships out at sea to the north of the island ready to swing round. So you'd basically want the battleships out of the way, so they, when they came in, they'd find the battleships weren't there. Nothing was there in harbour. It's all manoeuvring and able to move freely out of sea, and they'd fi fly into a whole load of land-based fighters. Same time as the carrier aircraft struck the enemy carriers, at which point, the once the carriers have been sunk, the battleships come in and attack the, uh, the fleet, and it gets wiped out in the surface action. Is there any sensibility, uh, sensibility in building a cruiser to a similar to an awesome design? Yeah, it's a very efficient design, and it's what I would have said if they do. And I have done that on UAD. In fact, I think I might do a run at some point building everything to Nelson all forward gun arrangement designs. Um, so, Nelson, my older brother has just announced the first RAF raid of the year. Ah, congratulations. Only four more to make ace. Uh, Frank Spotter, let's see. Do you prefer Art Deco? Over brutalism, yes. Um, honestly, I'm not that. Uh, to be honest, I'm not that fan, a uh, bigger fan of steel and glass either. But we'll leave that to one side. But I'm not exactly trapped in the 1990s. I just don't like the idea of just a full concrete. I, uh, you can do things, paint it. Don't leave it as brutal. You know, paint it, give it some color, give it some life, put some trees out there. For goodness sake, do not just leave it as a scrape of friggin' grass. Uh, there are so many things you can do. Do them. I, yeah, I remember working, walking through the really big one in London, where there's a school which Justin Craig usually teaches at, actually. Um, big development in London. Uh, not, not too far from London's wall. Oh... And it's got water all through it, and it's actually, it's not that bad, because it's actually had some work put into it. Most of the sites did not have that level of effort. Oh, what is it? A little bit interesting. Um, that must, would cavity magnetrons be possible in 1934, if the, right, if the right stars aligned? Yes. But you need a lot of stars to align to get to that by 1934. What is useless infrastructure? Well, I would say uh, there is a good example. Uh, there are some good examples in Thailand uh, where they've got some 16 lane highways in certain places where you don't have that much traffic. Uh, and there are some interesting spots in um, some other countries in the world where they've built a lot of infrastructure without needing to really build it. But uh, in a nice way for Britain post World War II, it needed to rebuild a lot of its infrastructure. It needed to build a road network. It needed to modernize its railways. It needed to modernize its ports. It needed to grow itself. Also need to do some land reclamation, some power imp improvement, all sorts of things need to be done, and um, yeah, that work need to be done. Uh, 
Nice hearing. Word of Mother of Class Bronze is planned pre world or two. They were on Henderson's list of things being put together as ideas, yes. Nice hearing. Would, uh, whose else would have, could have benefited from building close support shovel bomber monitors? Yeah, well, the United States really used battleships for it. Um, the British used battleships and the monitors. Uh. Italians wouldn't have said no to one. Russians? They could have used some of them. By Moses, what if the Falkland Islands were the size of Cuba, but the same distance from South America? Um, if they were the size of Cuba in terms of land area, but still the same shape and the same distance from South America, uh, then you'd have a far larger population down there, probably. And it'd be interesting. Um, what has replaced the close support shore bomb and monitor? Um, the 4-5 gun on the front. That's literally it. Uh, close air support from aircraft, helicopters, boats, and the 4-5 gun. Uh, that's what we're replacing it with. Um, no signal, no signal Removing the uppercase half from the reduction gearbox using lifting points and chain falls in the engine room? Uh, I don't think I've done that recently. I, I, I don't usually let it fall in the engine room. Uh, Runon, what happens if Mao, upon taking control of China, begins building the spine of the player, People's Liberation Army Navy infrastructure of fleet rapidly? More than likely, the British and Americans are looking at it, and the Soviets will also be reacting quite interesting. Uh, basically, if there's a massive naval build-up going on, then others are going to respond. At that time, yes. Not Canary Wharf, no. Um, oh, what is it? Barbican. Barbican Center. My friend, what makes a power plant good for a ship? What can you say about engineering? What makes a power plant good for a ship? Does it provide enough power for the ship? Does it provide have enough density of power generation? Does it provide enough? Is it easy to maintain? Is it able to deal deal with saltwater environment? And that basically decides whether it's good for a ship or not. I say, what of the Dominions? Who would buy the Hawkins class from the Royal Navy? Oh, probably the Australians. They'll buy. Um, they they they're happy to buy a lot. But I don't think the British want to sell them, or rather, they honestly they don't. No one really wants them. I must. What if the UK had done a low-rate production of 16-inch guns after watching the placing them in coast fortifications around the empire? Then they'd have had a um, probably a Mark IV or five 16-inch gun ready to go by the time they're doing the King George Vs. In which case, they would have had that available, ready to go, and. The argument for the 14-inch gun becomes even weaker, and the argument for the 14-inch gun in the face of the collapse of the Second London Naval Treaty becomes impossible, and you probably end up King George V with nine 16-inch guns of whatever mark they're at that, by that point. Let's take a look everyone. Would a 12 to 15,000 ton town class have triple or quad torpedo tubes? Um, possibly quad, but probably triples. It's going to depend on... It's going to depend on the person designing it and how much tonnage they want to put towards torpedoes. Um, I would be... Let me put it this way. I would say with the case of Canberra, there is no such thing as a right to survive a battle. No one has a right to survive a battle. The enemy always gets a vote. Okay, and life can always happen and all sorts of problems can happen. But the reality is... That battle, the way it was going, it's an interesting course of events which requires a lot of very close investigation to work it out. 
Knights of Gary question 38. If the Japanese had further developed the British Formula One Attack 91 pom pom air gun of the interwar period, would they have had a decent medium air gun by the start of World War II? Who knows? They could have done. Do they have the money and infrastructure to do it? What do they do? What what what, what count supports that? And what does that not go in? What does that more funding? Where does that funding come from? What are they not doing to do that? Twenty-two barbell class. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, so basically, the twenty-two barbell class. They don't. What do you mean in the nineteen sixties? For World War Two. For World War Two. Uh, if you're getting, well, basically the equivalent of the uh, of the barbell class for British is the um, for the Royal Navy. Is probably ooh, is it the Explorer class or the Sticker Back class? Actually, no. It's probably the Oberon class. So we had the Oberons. If you'd had the Oberons, and one of the Oberons we went on, it was actually um, in Australia. Uh, if we'd had the Oberons in World War Two. Pretty much, they replaced the operational requirements of T's to an extent. You suddenly have that range. A range of 10,350 nautical miles. They have six forward torpedoes and 20 tubes and two short, uh, stern, to, uh, stern tubes. So yeah, I would say they are going to replace some of the T in some of the T duties. So they probably be operating in the Far East. They'd certainly be providing the Royal Navy with some of the operations in the Mediterranean, etc., in areas like that, because the British are chucking submarines everywhere. Uh, one of the other things, again, I, I I've had this conversation with. Yeah, you have a famously the Royal Navy uses a submariner to run its to run its war in World War Two and the Battle of the Atlantic and take over from Nobel. Max Horton, and yes, I've had conversation with people who people who the same people who believe the Royal Navy didn't have any aircraft carriers seem to believe the Royal Navy in World War Two didn't have any submarines. And you go, no, they did. Well, where are the famous sinkings? Well, they did a couple actually. They did some of the Italian ships, and they did some German ships, and they did some Japanese ships. The trouble is, though, whereas there is this rather big thing called the Battle Atlantic, which is against the German submarines. Which the Germans get to lead, uh, which the Germans, of course, submarines are part of, but the British submarines really aren't part of. And the Americans get to lead, really, the uh, against Japan because they're providing the sheer volume of submarines that are blockading Japan, and Britain's providing a fair number of them. The British major submarine campaign that you don't hear about is in the Mediterranean, and the Mediterranean War is one of those interesting wars where you don't really hear a lot about it. The battles are massive, sometimes go on for days, weeks even, of constant fighting and forces turning up every day and blasting away at you. It's non-stop, and yet we hear very little about the Battle of Mediterranean. Firstly. That's one of the reasons why I try and chuck it in as often as I can. Yeah, let's see the London School for Girls is a fun one to go and work for. In terms of when I take Justin, Justin Craig runs a centre there, a vision centre, and I, I go and be the course director occasionally. It's a fun one to go work with. The Barbican Centre is both awful and actually improve. Uh, let me put it this way: the Barbican Centre is not really attractive, yet compared to some of the other, many a vast majority of others, it is actually an improvement. 
that tells you what some of the uh, most of the others were like. But the Barbican Centre has done a lot of they've done a lot of work to put a lot of greenery, a lot of water into it, and it's it's actually moderately nice to go walking around these days. And you can find some pretty cool re uh, pretty cool restaurants, good barbecue joints. There is a Bordeens not far away, and Bordeens are very good. If you find Bordeens in London, you found good barbecue for the UK. And please know what I'm saying there before anyone starts going, no, it's not good barbecue. Good barbecue for the UK. Baldeans is good barbecue for the UK. So you got, Alex, the treaty restricted the battleships from having guns lying on 16 inch, but does it stop development of shore batteries and for monitors? Um, that's a kind of, uh, well, monitors, yes. Shore ba batteries, uh, it will be kind of against the spirit, but not letter. And I'd say, question 39, if more cannon class are being built as they should have been, what when would the time frame of the commission speak? Well, basically, if they're building them as their sets, they're building them eights, eights, eights. So if they keep building them in sets of eight, which they were realistic, realistically supposed to be, you have them all commissioned as they were at the original timeline, but they would have been eight commissions. So, and so, so if we consider the county class. Um, so... The Royal Navy, instead of, uh, well, with, let's see, they are commissioned between, well, from about 1928 onwards, um, but the Royal Navy built five for the Kent Batch. They are all commissioned by May 1928. You would have commissioned eight in that period. You would have commissioned eight by tw in 1929 from the London batch. You'd have commissioned eight in 1930 from the Norfolk batch. They cancel free in January 1930 due to the London Naval Treaty. So basically you would have had 16, 18 commissioned already, plus the Hawkins and Australia and Canberra. Um... Which is why, well, basically what happens to Australian Canberra is they are make up units 6 and 7, and they just don't build the 8. But in realistic terms, the Royal Navy should have been building 8 and 8 and 8. That's what they were hoping for. And the thing is, you would have that would have ended up with... Mm, well, they've got, they, they're doing 5. So let's say they get, they get 2 out of... Well, 2 out of 4 named ones. So let's say they get 3... So you'd have twenty. You'd have sixteen plus three in Royal Navy, nineteen plus let's say three Australian. So that's twenty-two, and then you'd have the Hawkins class, which at that point would have been Hawkins class in nineteen thirty. Uh, that's four vessels in 1930, so 26, 26, so basically 260,000 tons would have been the minimum for heavy cruisers. Um, yeah, thank you, the Royal Navy would take that, but it would probably have to be changed around. Probably end up with being out the analysis being you're allowed... Well, they'd, ha they'd have to work it out. Honestly, they would. The Americans... The naval treaties... I have the maps in front of me. I have the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, London. 1930. Um... ba da ba num ba da That one. Uh, 
Oh, uh, yeah. There's, there's the file. There is the file. Why do I have so many Excel spreadsheets entitled London Treaty? Because you work on this far too often. So, historically, the treaty was the British got 192,000 for 143,000. They would, you, you'd be sort of, the Americans would be going, well, uh, oh, you, you you probably end up with 270,000 tons. Or more likely. The British have got 260,000 tons of heavy cruiser. The American, you might end up having, the British on a provider go, you might end up with 300,000 being in the agreed tonnage for heavy cruisers for the Americans. And the Brit and the working down from that. And the British, goodness knows what their tonnage agreement is for the light cruisers. Because the British would want something, and if they're going to drop, maybe, maybe they give 40,000 tons of that, and they then get... Well, at that point, because they've got that many to do that, they're going to want to match that length shit, so they're going to want to have... Yeah, the, you might end up with the British getting like 340,000 tons for their lighter, for their... Um, their light cruiser allowance, so they can get build 34 of them at 10,000 tons of ton uh, pop. And the Americans taking 300,000 tons and 300,000 tons for theirs. And the Japanese taking their position out of that. Um, five pre ratio, that's going to be 180,000 tons. For both. That'd be interesting. Food is not nearly as bad in the UK as often prepared, uh, portrayed, but the, yeah, the barbecue, Bordeens. If you're in the UK, if you're in London, Bordeens is the barbecue place to look up. It's really, really good stuff. They do really, really nice work. And um, yeah, I have a lot of enjoyment with Bordeens whenever I go there. They're also usually very nice staff. I have to say the thing I really enjoy about going out to restaurants in the UK, which I do not enjoy when I'm in Canada or America, is um, I'm tipping because it's a it's a nice way to thank you them thank them for being a uh, being helpful. It's not I don't feel like I have to tip because otherwise my server might starve. I do love it every time I'm told by some people when they, whenever that's sort of brought up as a case of, we have to do this because otherwise the restaurants would go out of business. That doesn't make sense as a logical thing. It just doesn't. But in the UK, we have other issues in that we um, don't really pay our, okay, a lot of other people what they're worth. It's all swings and roundabouts in every system. Every country has its own issues. Um, uh, nice evening. That's gone past one minute. Last question from tonight. I mean, question 40. It has gone past midnight. No, it has. I've <laughs> been going for five and a quarter hours. Okay. Um, last one for me. With 40 canning class in service, how much use would the, would the modernized ones be? Uh, very useful still. Because, they, let me put it this way. 
There is modernization on the scale of London, and there is the fact that most of them are kept modern. This is the trouble. Sometimes people pick on the figure modernized. They've had the new structure. They've had the full rebuild. Yeah, that's great. But have they got up-to-date fire control? Have they got up-to-date? Are their engines working? Are all the things... That, that's what makes this ship useful in World War II. If it has had its armor fitted. Yay. Great. That will make it useful. Modernized. It's a nice to have. It's not an essential. Remember, I recently lost. I was speculating as to what you might be doing. Also, can I strongly suggest you obtain and utilize a multi gas monitor? It could save your life. Probably would be sensible, and I probably should look into that at some point. Um, back when I was, could four triple turret 18 inch gun fast battleships with small tube boilers uh, to hit 28 knots have been possible by the UK in 1918 on 55,000 ton standards? Um, probably. Honestly, we know they've got an 18 inch gun program going, we know they've got small tube boilers. We know they can build ships of that roughly that tonnage because that's what they're planning on building. So yeah. Obviously, we often hear about good admirals that come from many different backgrounds. Which ones come from engines? Um, oh, good lord. You have some interesting officers. Um, you see, the Royal Navy, up to a while, had a rank of Engineer Rear Admiral. And... That was up till about 1915. But in terms of actually picking them out, hmm, actual engineers who became admirals. Trying to think of them. I can name destroyer ones, I can name ones which come from. That's nice. Actual engineering officers. The trouble is for engineering officers is they don't always get much bridge time. And that can affect your chance to be getting promoted. How much time you get on the bridge. If you currently go through the Royal Navy's current senior officers, and I've got that list up ahead, the most senior vice engineering officer you've got is Vice Admiral Paul Marshall, who's the Director General of Ships, Defense and Equipment and Support. So yeah, he's an engineer. Um, the full admirals are the Chief of Defense Force, the First Sea Lord, and... Um, the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe. So you've got David Ratkin, John K Benjamin Key, and um, Edward Bl uh, Keith Edward Blount. Um, Um, it's a well-known fact that pretty much, uh, quite a lot of this um, these personnel are the se some of the senior ones are pretty much reinventions of the old things, old titles. Uh, engineering. So let's go, Vice Admiral. Uh, next below that we've got James Godfrey Hibben. He was director of ship support, defence equipment and support. Yeah, engineer. Um, Donald J. Dool is engineer. Paul Quirrell Christopher, director of innovation and future capability, defence equipment and support. Uh, Thomas E. Mason. Military Aviation Authority. Yeah, he's engineering background. Um, Jeremy Bailey, Director of Submarine Support, Navy Command, is engineering background. 
Tim for Krista Woods, UK Defence Attaché to the United States, uh, USA, and Head of the British Defence Staff, United States, is an engineer. As are quite a lot of the senior officers of the Royal Navy at the rank of Rear Admiral. Um, there are a lot of them from the engineering and branches. Um, if we go down to Commodores, there's a fair number of those as well. Yeah. And... Surprisingly, all the Surgeon Commodore's branches were medical. I can't think why that might be. And the Fleet Auxiliary's branches are also Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Um, they're Commodore's. Yeah. Uh, I'd have to go back and trace them, honestly, to try and figure that one out. There aren't that many, but they are, there are certain positions where they used to be, and they used to be positions like the Admiral of the Engineers, etc. Uh, am I keeping my old computer case or tossing it? Keeping it. It's going to be turned into a server once we're in the new place, and I've got the proper network set up to run the server. Um, next one, let's see. We often hear about good... Oh, I'll answer that one. So, I think I'm going to end the questions in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you, Jack Ray, for more memberships. Is it still managing to dodge Melanie? How to avoid packing, any instructor light screen. Yes, it does. Yeah, um, always pay your staff properly. It's the first rule my family always taught ourselves. It yeah, always learn. Uh, it's basically it always pay your troops or you pay your staff, and you'll have a you know not to deliver, and you you tend to have loyal people. It's amazing. Yeah, minimum wages. Mm. Yeah, and some. Really weird stuff. I remember once I was working actually for an American company in the UK, and um, well, I was going to. And I looked at the hours they were requesting, and they were trying to tell me I was going to be an independent contractor. And I worked out the hours would be the hours they were requiring me to do to work the project, and they wanted me to spend on it. It would have worked out at five pound an hour. For some reason, I said no. They said it was an awful lot of money they were offering. And I went, yes, it's a nice high figure. It works out about £5 an hour. Go find someone else that. They actually came back to me with a different offer later on. And it ended up being quite lucrative. But yeah, their initial offer was terrible. I have a 12 and a half hour shift tomorrow I volunteered for. Dan, you've got to stop doing that. Anyway. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much, everyone, for chatting away. We've been live for roughly almost five and a half hours. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I hope you found it interesting. I certainly have found it fun. Um, goodness knows how many questions and what I've answered them on. And, yeah, as I said, packing up, doing Lego, all sorts of things happened today. We even had the Patreon announcements of what's coming on Patreon. And as I've said before, but I will say again in this video, the Patrons for June and July could well be turned into top four get a recorded video for June and July, rather than necessarily getting a live because of the differences of wandering around. So rather than them getting a live, they might get a recorded video, and I will try and keep the brew ships live on the Thursday, on the Sundays, but the Thursdays will be premieres, and there'll be extra recorded videos on the Saturdays to try and make up for it. 
so that, you know, you have the topics, there's still the same number of videos, but it's just going to be a case of June, July are looking an absolute nightmare. May, I'm... April and May, uh, for hopefully, hopefully we get this all signed off and I get into the house as soon as possible and I get to start the work off, but I'm basically superintending the build um, through May, uh, through April and May. Hopefully we all get that. And then June, I'm back up here sorting things out and then um, then hopefully we're all, if everything's planned and everything's put forward, we everything's sorted out, we're off. And then I get get back till the middle of July, and frankly, yeah, that's it's a lot easier if it's recorded videos. So thank you very much, everyone. Much I can guarantee it far better. Thank you, Stafford. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Frank Bamel. Thank you, Team Locker. Thank you, Renon. Thank you, Reptrat. Thank you, Inter Morrison. Thank you, Drakenred. Thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Steve Clark. Thank you, Frank Bamel. Thank you, Daniel Wright. Thank you, DJ Forty. Thank you, Night Six Eight One. Thank you, everyone who's been watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you had a nice time, and just thank you for watching. Take care. Thank you, Calvin Gasberg, and thank you, Seneca Nero. Thank you, everyone. Whew. Step by step. It is certainly going to be a step by step scenario. Thank you, everyone. Take care, and toodles. You, I'm sure you will do, Dan. I, I, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to your muscles appearing. Uh, that before anyone else, Dan and Drac were with me help moving stuff out of the attic. We managed to get half done. They have promised to come back and finish off the other half. So, yeah. Thank you. They're superstars. <laughs>